Can you hear me, Jeff? Hey, Don. Hey, how we doing? Good, thanks. How you doing? All right. Busy day today? <laughs> Every Tuesday is a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, are you able to uh, give me a green light for sharing screen? Yep. Hold on. I'm just closing all yep. my email. So it's not. No, I understand. Yep. No rush. Um, okay. It's up on the screen now, Don. I can see it. Great. Just seeing uh, you, Jeff. I don't see anyone else except for Matt. Yeah, we got a few uh, folks from the public yep. uh, in. No, no other members yet. Hannah's coming in now, and uh, I don't have H Cam. Um, well, well, we'll be recording this anyway, so if okay. they don't, we can forward it to them. You know. Yep. All right, Jim's coming in now. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Jim. How are you hey, doing? Jim. All right. Yeah. Who's that? Don. Hey, Don. Yes. Nice forehead. Thank you. I don't know if they can see. I know they can see me. Hey, Don. Thanks for all the stuff on the uh, on Sandy yeah. Beach. Yeah. Ahead yeah. of the meeting. Um, sure. I've, I've I've taken the charge of uh, getting this done, and there's clearly eh, not not a lot of um, I don't know, uh, records, memory at Parks and Rec, because apparently it wasn't Jay. So I'm trying to put the whole thing together and thank you for your part. You're, you're welcome. But, um, so that was that. Um, so Ted, for... Ted and Melissa um, are with us. So we have a quorum. What was it wasn't late, was it? What's that, Ted? How you doing? I'm doing well. I said I wasn't late, was I? Nope. No. We, we no. still have a few more minutes. All right. Good, good, good. We're almost, we're almost done. I, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was listening okay. in on the select board meeting because they were discussing whether they would save a spot on the warrant for a tree protection bylaw. Uh, and ultimately, they voted four to one not to save that spot and that the planning board ought to be doing that. Has Zach, did Zach work on that? Yes, it, it came right at the end of Zach's work on um, trying to limit commercial solar development. Um, if you're interested, I know it's not on our agenda because I'm only bringing it up now, but if anyone's interested and if it's allowed, I'd be happy to fill you in on uh, Zach's solar development stuff, which will get you right up yeah. to date that select board meeting and the vote that just happened five minutes ago. Yeah, we could bring it up at the public forum section of the meeting. 
you know, we created yeah. a gym. You, you can be question. number three. You Okay, you tell me when, and I will do my best to be as brief as I can, but also to, to fill people in as best as I can. Yeah, you don't have to be brief. No, be brief. <laughs> it's a long and winding story. I will try to shorten and straighten it. <laughs> it, it but, uh, have you ever found anything in town that isn't a long and winding story? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. No, oh, I don't know. Every once in a while, it's pretty straightforward. Not often. <laughs> All right, so, so. There you go, Don's emails. And Anna, thank you for sending me the original order conditions for that. Uh, You're very welcome. Hey, so is Town Hall open again? Because I heard that, uh, the, I don't know, the, the new president said we can open our town halls. Or something like is it open? It is not open to the public. It's by appointment only still. Uh, okay. And most offices are closed most of the time anyway. Yeah, I just need a dog license. Okay, at Not seven o'clock, let's uh, call the meeting to order. We're still waiting on Janine, Ed, and Kerry, but we do have a quorum. Uh, so let me begin by reading the uh, scripts for the remotely conducted uh, meetings. Uh, good evening. This is the open meeting of the Hopkinton Conservation Commission. It's being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. This meeting will feature public comment. Uh, for this meeting, the Conservation Commission is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Additionally, the meeting is also being broadcast uh, or will be broadcast um, by HCAM. We're recording it tonight and actually I'm admitting HCAM now, so uh, they will be presenting it live uh, momentarily. Uh, accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast by voice or video may be captured by the recording. Some more supporting materials that have been provided to members of the commission for this meeting are available on the town's website. After commission members and staff have discussed each project application on the agenda, the chair will then open the discussion to public comment. Members of the public who wish to speak are asked to identify their name and address. Three minutes will be afforded for each public comment. Finally, each vote in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote of the commission members. So let me start by just confirming uh, members are present uh, through a roll call attendance. Uh, Melissa Ricos. Here. Carrie's not with us yet. Jim Cirillo. Here. Ed Harrow is not with us. Janine LeBlanc. Present. Ted Barker Hook. Here. And this is Jeff Barnes. And we have uh, Don McAdam present, Anna uh, Rogers is present, and Matt uh, Verrill, our consultant, is present. Okay. Very good. So, documents um, that were reviewed. Don, we have Hayes, 16 Downey Street, the order of conditions, Morrow, 88 Franklin Road, the determination of applicability, 
in the Hopkinton Public Schools 129 Hayden Row, uh, the Certificate of Compliance, and that was for the Marathon School. So I think yes. we're, we're all set on those. Except for um, the uh, Certificate of Compliance for the Marathon School, this is a, a revisit. The, the commission had uh, asked for revised um, as belts that showed the PIB. The PIB okay. was installed, it just wasn't shown on the as belt. So we did so get we, revised plans and that should be the only item. And then um, we'll make sure that the erosion controls are all removed before we issue the COC, if that's amenable with the commission. Okay, that sounds good to me. Is there anyone who uh, opposes that on the commission? Okay, I think we're good to go, Don. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, new applications received, Solon. Uh, 1993 trust. That's just a COC application. Yep. Norton 13 Wild Road, another COC application. And CS2K Hopkinton LLC, a, an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation. Let's see if we'll get those to you at the next meeting. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, Galazi, 36 Stony Brook Road. This is a project change request done. Yes, let's see, 1623. This was the driveway? I believe correct? so, yes, yep. So 2021 driveway. Um, cracking them open now. He gave us a color plan and a and a um, look like a black and white. So um, zoom in for you. Yeah. Okay. That's actually helpful because the plan that I was looking at uh, that was submitted didn't wasn't in color, so it was kind of hard to see. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. This is this is helpful. So it looks like a posed retaining wall here, mm -hmm. I think to expand uh, the driveway area. I assume everything else is the same. So the retaining wall is, um... and here's the- It's outside the buffer, right? Um... Yes. Yep. So there's just a portion of the driveway there, that little section that's within the hundred foot buffer zone. Yeah, I'm just not seeing what what exists as the drive because it's showing it as proposed in red, and then there's a line here, existing driveway. Yeah, so, I think it's I think it's uh, top there, Don, to the left of where the proposed retaining wall is. Yeah, the the existing driveway goes straight into. Oh, the garage. straight in. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's rather steep, and that's the issue. Okay, to try and get that steepness out of the driveway. Okay, so then yeah, obviously it would be this area then inside the buffer zone. Right, so that's where the pro that's where the existing proposed location is. Right, it's the driveway isn't actually there, or is it? Yeah, no. they've installed they've installed the driveway here. So it, it is already there. Yeah, but it's all outside the commission's jurisdiction. Get now they it. want to build a new one where a portion of it would go within the commission's jurisdiction. Okay. I mean, that looks like it's a fairly small area there um, that would have been existing lawn anyways, right? Right. Um, I think I'm okay with that. Does anyone have any questions or comments from the commission? No. That look no. Okay. Everyone uh, okay with that? Hey, Jeff. Yes. It sounds like we've got the property owner on the call, if you guys have questions for him. Okay. Uh, Mr. Galizia, are you on the call here? Uh, yes, sir. I am. Hi. Good evening. Hello. Um, so it looks like you just, uh, I think, I don't know if you were listening on, in on the conversation, but there's a issue with the slope at the existing location, which is the reason why you're putting it um, down here to the south. 
Exactly. Yeah, it's a little too steep for my wheelchair. Uh, so just hope we're trying to maximize the length as much as best as we could get it to try and decrease the steepness of it. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I don't think uh, it's just a small portion of the driveway that's in the in the buffer zone. I don't think anyone has an issue with that. So you should be okay. All righty. Do okay. I need to stick on the call for the rest of the time or? Nope. You can, uh, unless you have a burning interest to listen to a conservation commission meeting, you're welcome to stay on. Otherwise, um, you can watch the Bruins game, I guess. Oh, all righty. Thank <laughs> you, folks. Appreciate your help. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, if I can get a motion to approve the project change request as discussed. So moved. So moved. I'll second it. Okay, so Janine made the motion. Uh, Jim seconded, and we'll do the roll call vote. Melissa? Aye. Janine? Aye. Ted? Aye. Jim? Aye. And Jeff is an aye. Okay, thank you. All right, Brinshaw Corp, 47 Stony Brook Road. This is a review of the disturbance. B97. So the commission looked at this at the at the last meeting and the commission wanted uh, more information about where the existing erosion controls were and, and how much area had got disturbed. Mm -hmm. So uh, the applicant's consultant was able to generate this plan for the commission's review. Okay. All right, and I believe Mr. Mark Wynott is on the call. Yep, good evening. Good evening. Um, Ian, uh, Carrie's coming in now, just for the record. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, Mr. Mark. Or not. You just want to uh, kind of walk us through this? Certainly. Um, so uh, Stony Brook Road is to the left of the plan. Uh, the wetlands are on the, if you will, kind of the bottom. So mm -hmm. the very short, dark black line is the limit that the board approved uh, for limited work as the back edge of erosion controls. And follow that point all the way down. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, same size dashed line, but in red, is, is today's existing uh, back of erosion controls. So you can see that it's just a little bit down, a little bit closer uh, to the wetland edge than that black line. Um, there's a very, very faint uh, red line. Uh, that's the limit of disturbance that we located from the sideline of Stony Brook Road all the way down to the bottom of the page and to the right to the South Bar Rodden Gun. So uh, we have four little areas of uh, disturbance. Uh, we have, I believe one down at the bottom dawn, a little bit lower on the plan. You okay, yeah. Here we go. So we call that little area number one, right, right there. Yeah. Yep, is uh, 34 square feet. Uh, so obviously we're locating the limit of disturbance today uh, based on the wood, wood cutting to the black line. And that would uh, indicate 34 square feet and a dimension of four and a half feet below it would be the uh, dimension from the previously approved line to the limit of the worst case limit of disturbance extends four and a half feet beyond the limit that was previously approved. Okay. Um, a little bit to the top of the page and going towards Stony Brook Road, we have an area number two and area number three, both at 14 square feet. 
very small uh, disturbances. Um, yeah, okay, I see those. So this, yeah, that dimension would be 3.3 and then 3.5 area number three. Uh, the biggest difference, uh, which is uh, disturbance area number four, 600 square feet, uh, is that cross-hatched area there uh, from the black line again to the little red line um, is uh, 600 square feet. And we also added some dimension from the red line. Today's erosion control, uh, close to 17.7 uh, feet. Um, the, you can kind of see a faint purple line from around the edge of disturbance number three. Mm -hmm. uh, that section of new erosion control that goes up towards the the ago and then matches it was reestablished along that black line back over to Stony Brook Road. So in that area there, we have two lines of erosion control um, right there, and then certainly the red line. Okay. Okay. So those are kind of our four little areas, and that's the differences between what was approved and what got installed. Got it. Okay, so how many trees were removed from these areas, Mr. Mark? Do you have any idea? Or Mr. Um, I believe Mr. Crenshaw is on the, on, the, uh, on the call as well. Yeah. Um, in, the, in, the, in the area one, two, and three, uh, the, the limited disturbance at those three locations are very small. Mm -hmm. uh, the disturbance area itself, the turned up area was very, very minor. So it's hard to tell, but I can't imagine that there's any significant trees that were there at those locations. Uh, the area, area number four, the cross edge area close to uh, Stony Brook Road, uh, there you go, yeah. is, is comprised of a lot of rock. Um, and you can see there's a little slope to it, little edge to it, um, back to the picture, but... Um, Got it, okay. It, you know, it, the rock must have appeared when uh, the tree was taken out. So you could almost envision that there was some trees at that location but the size, you can see there that they're not very big. Doesn't mean there wasn't something bigger. Mm -hmm. But I, I honestly don't remember anything of significant size. I would venture to guess it's more like what you see in that picture today. And how many, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. All right. So we have the new erosion controls uh, put in place. Um, so that's good. You know, I think my sense is is that in these areas you know we'll just need to um put so you know we'll just need to in the springtime just revegetate those areas and let them you know come back to uh you know re regrow out um is my sense matt do you uh do you have any comment there um <clears throat> yeah i mean i agree with dave that the the larger area seems to be where potentially there were some trees taken down, although there, were, there really weren't any stumps visible. Um, I did note in the larger area there was, um, it looked like probably where witch hazel had been cut down. Probably there's some, you know, witch hazel is sort of a large shrub, small tree type species. Uh, mm -hmm. There was definitely some evidence of cutting of that. Um, that may or may not re-sprout from the roots. Um, I guess it's, you know, a couple of ways this could be looked at. It'll be to, you know, uh, wait until spring, see how it recovers, maybe ask for a report, you know, towards the end of spring to see how it looks. And if it doesn't seem like it's recovering that well, then maybe at that point require some plantings to, to mitigate for the loss of any shrubs or trees that were done, or just to go right to that now and just require you know, some amount of plantings through that area, whether they be trees or shrubs. Yeah, I like, I, let's, I'm leaning towards option one. Let's, uh, you know, the area's fairly small. 
um, you know, in area. So let's, you know, wait till spring, um, you know, see what kind of revegetation occurs there naturally. Um, you know, the applicant can, uh, well, not the applicant, but the, you know, the, the, the developer can provide us with a report. Maybe it makes sense to have you go back out in the spring, Matt, take a look at it. And if it looks like it's not really doing much, you know, then we, we can require some, you know, supplemental plantings in there to, to kind of restore it. I think that makes sense to me. Let me just open it up to the other commission members for their um, thoughts as well. That sound okay to everyone? Yes. Let me yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Crenshaw, did you have any uh, comments? No. Jeff? Yes. Are you guys there? Yes. Hi, this is Dave, this is Dave Wilkinson of Brunshaw. I, I don't have comments other than whatever you whatever you like me to do. I'm happy to do. You know, we made the error with the erosion control, so we'll we'll go with whatever you like us to do. Okay, we appreciate that. Um, thank you for your cooperation. Um, you know, as I said, we'll just wait till the spring and uh, see how the area um, does. You know, naturally in terms of the revegetation, we'll just uh, kind of regroup at that point. Um, will, will, will we be able to move forward with uh, doing some work in there to um, start working on the project? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the new the new erosion control controls have been established. Um, you know, we just we ask that you be cognizant cognizant of that. You know, with the work going forward. No, certainly. Uh, but you should be uh, okay at this point to uh, proceed with the the work. Okay. okay. So the Yes, Matt. Uh, the only other outstanding item that kind of triggered a lot of these inspections to begin with was uh, they would have reestablished the wetland flagging along the edge per the uh, order. I'm not sure if that's been done yet or not. I don't know if Dave can speak to that or. <clears throat> yes, it has. It, it has been established, uh, reestablished. They're in blue and everything's marked. Um, the only other thought we had was uh, back to the picture. Dawn, is there any chance to bring that picture up that Matt, Matt took? uh the other the other one looking at it from the, there you go the uh, first one yep yes we had a thought uh to maybe help that regeneration uh to see if we have a little fork that we could add to the machine and just pick those rocks out uh there's a few of them there we could without excavation we could pick those rocks out it might help with the regeneration of the existing plant life any thoughts to that yeah, I think that uh, that sounds okay to me. You know, if they're just on the surface, right? Right. Uh, yep. That I think that's fine. Uh, okay. Matt, do you see any uh, issue with that? Um, <clears throat> I would probably want to take a look at it. To see, I mean, if those were rocks were there originally, then I, I would say that it'd be best to be left there. Um, but if they were, you know, moved around and it looks like maybe they're sitting on something that might revegetate, then yeah, it would make sense, I guess, to to pull them out, okay. but I, I think I probably need to go out there and take a look at the wetland reflagging anyway, so I can take a look at the same time, and then okay. just um, get back to Don or advise um, Mr. Marquardt directly, whatever you prefer. Okay, okay. Yeah, that make that makes sense. When you check in the flags, Matt, if you can just check that out as well, and uh, either get back to Mr. Marquardt or Mr. Wilkinson. Um, okay. All right. Very good. Thank you, folks. Right, thank, thank you. you. Have, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We'll move on to the um, public hearing. It's uh, 723. So um, St. Pierre, 1 Woody Island Road, a notice of intent to raise and construct a new single family home. And I just need to read this for the record. Hopkinton Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, January 26, 2021 at 7 o'clock p.m. Virtually online to hear all persons interested in a notice of intent filed by Thomas St. Pierre to raise a single family house and construct a new single family house with associated site work. The location is 1 Woody Island Road, assessor's map 
L35, lot 27, lot zero. Okay, good evening. Do we have the applicant on the phone or the um, applicant's consultant? Yes, uh, it's Vito Colonna with Connor Stone Engineering. Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, Tom and Sabine St. Pierre are also on the call if you have questions directly for them. Um, but I'll start off with the summary of what the project is and uh, what they're looking to do. Um, Sounds good. So the, this is an existing lot on the corner of Woody Island uh, and Hayward Street. So it's right now it's 15,600 square foot lot. Um, you have the lake obviously right to the back um, with the lake front, there's a wall, there's an existing dock and a small deck you know, right up against that lake front. And then you also have wetlands across the street from Woody Island Road. Uh, there's some BBW over there. Um, that was noted in the 100 foot buffer extends across the street into the site. So the existing site is built out right now. There's a existing house on there. It's about 745 square feet for the footprint of it. And there's also a garage uh, up front and there's also a driveway that leads up to that garage. And like I said, the whole site is essentially built out. Um, you know, there's a little bit of patch of trees in the front, but the rest of it's mainly lawn and then built up right to the edge of the lake front. Yep, that's a perfect view of it right there. Um, yep. And yep, so there's the existing house and the existing garage, which I, um, the garage on this one is the lower one. It's actually larger than the uh, existing house that's out there. So the, the proposal is right now is to remove that existing house and remove the deck off the back and then replace it with a new, uh, a new house. So the existing garage and the driveway and everything else would remain. Uh, it's just essentially removing that house and construction of a new house out there. And as part of the house, we would have a deck off the backside and then also an associated uh, patio um, around the back and the sides of it. And the intent was to create, construct that out of a pervious paver uh, material to help some infiltration uh, in that area. So the limit of work uh, extends around the perimeter of the, the site. And in the rear, we've tried to kept as far as we can from the, the edge of the lake, um, but to get the patio and allow for some room for the excavation and construction of the house, uh, that rear line is about nine feet uh, off the limit of uh, the delineated edge of, uh, edge of lake. So we have asked for a waiver from both the 50 foot uh, no structure or no build and also the 50 foot uh, no disturb zone. Um, so I think we did have to update those waivers earlier today. Um, I had it as a pre-existing lot, um, but uh, Don sent us some other information today. So we did update that um, to show that it would be a 50 foot uh, no disturbance zone and the 50 foot no build zone. And we did try to push the house as far as possible away from the lake. Um, but we are restrained by some of the, the zoning setbacks, obviously. And we are before or going before ZBA to allow some of those so to attempt to allow that relief uh, to push the lake as uh, push the house as far as we can from the lake itself. So the existing house was 28 feet about and we are right now going to be about tw uh, 38 feet. Uh, so we've moved the house 10 feet further from the lake. And then as far as the decks go, the existing deck um, that was 19 feet from the lake and our new proposed deck would be about 31 feet from the lake. So we're trying to move, we move those structures a little bit away from the lake as far as we could um, and still being able to fit, um, you know, the house uh, that they've, they were looking at. Um, that's pretty much our summary. I can start taking questions, comments. Okay. So is that entire area there between the existing house and the lake, is that all lawn right now? Yeah, right now it's lawn. I don't know if we can get another, the aerial photo of we it. We don't need the photo. We'll take oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> you can kind of see it right there, though. Pretty good. And there's a, a fence, but there's a wall down by the lake. Um, you can almost see it on the photo right there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right, so uh, Lucas reviewed this, had a couple comments. So let me just go through those real quick. Um, so it looks like a portion of the neighboring property at uh, 5 Woody Island Road appears to be on this property. Is that 
correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, we just okay. did the boundary survey on that and it was found that, yeah, their patio in the driveway, um, there's a shrub line out there when you go down Woody Island and that looks like it would be the property line. Um, yeah, right there, but actually that driveway and the patio and everything is on the locust site. Okay, but that's not gonna impede any of the proposed work. Uh, no, no, there's a, there's a fence out there too. Um, so it kind of separates everything. So that shrub line, and then there's a, a fence. Um, I think we're basically gonna kind of respect that line uh, as far as the work goes. Okay, work. fair enough. Um, and then typically one of the requests that we have um, for any kind of project along the lake um, or around the lake is that, you know, the roof runoff is run through um, an infiltration system. So it's, you know, directly discharged to the uh, water table. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just wanted to, you know, that's typically something that we request. So okay. I want to make sure that you guys are, met, are met, amenable to that. Okay. I would assume so. All right. And then, um, you know, we just need to modify the plan mm -hmm. um, to, you know, show where the infiltration would be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do some, uh, do some, you know, quick calculations just to make sure that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we usually do about for, the, for the runoff from the house, right? Yeah, we usually do about an inch of runoff over the roof, uh, just for a typical drywall. Okay, and we can do that as an after the fact submittal. Um, or not an after the fact, but contingent on, you know, we can vote on it contingent on uh, receipt of that, that information, um, I think. Um, all right, moving along. Uh, so was, do you know if a chapter 91 permit was, um, I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know if they have one of those. Uh, Do you mind if I, can I speak? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Mrs. So we are actually in the process of filing that. So we've started the paperwork, but we can't submit it until once we've gone through all these channels. So we're, we've got it ready and set to go. And then we, we plan to submit once we have all the appropriate paperwork. So. Okay, perfect. If you can just copy the commission on that when it's, uh, you know, when that's done, that would be helpful. Sure. Great. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, Matt, did you have any other comments? No, I think you covered it all. All right. Thank you. This one. Okay. Um, comments or questions from commission members? No. Okay, comments or questions from the public? And let me just check to see if we have any hands raised. Through, through the chair, we did have uh, a couple of uh, letters from uh, abutters uh, all uh, in favor of the project. Okay, great. Thank you, Don. I don't see anyone's hands raised. Um, for the participants, if there's anyone who has a comment, you can speak up now. Okay. All right. If I get a motion to close and approve the notice intent subject to a revised plan being submitted showing the uh, infiltration um, location and the associated calculations. This is Melissa. I'll make that motion. All right, and a second, please. Carrie, second. All right, Carrie seconded, and we'll go through the roll call vote. So, Melissa? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Janine? Aye. Ted? Aye. Jim? Aye. And Jeff is an aye. Okay, very good. Thank all you, right. folks. Thank, you, Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Thank you for You're your time. You're welcome. Yeah. Have a good evening. You too. You as well. Thanks. Good luck. Okay. All right, uh, Claro, zero Hayden Row. This is a continuation of a notice of intent for a single family home.
I don't know if anyone from Gary or Halnon is uh, on the call. The consultant yeah. on the call here. Don, I, I'm here. I mean, this is Bob Boxer. How you doing, Mr. Boxer? I'm, I'm good. Very good. I'm from Gary and Halnon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Okay, you want to kind of walk us through um, where we're at on this project, please? Sure. So um, we have this um, single lot on Hayden Row Street, one of the few remaining lots on that side of the street that haven't been developed yet. Um, we had the wetlands delineated. Uh, Matt went out and walked them with, with Goddard and made some corrections. We made a couple of little changes to the line. And we so we provided a, a we're showing a four bedroom two story home with a two car attached garage that um, that's that's all work is being within the 50 foot outside the 50 foot no disturb buffer limit of disturbance. Uh, we're proposing erosion control, um, a post and rail fence with a permanent mobile barrier. Uh, this house is serviced by municipal water and sewer, and um, utilities are shown as being is connected to the, the house. We uh, we limited the amount of uh, the house is right at the front yard setback and as close to the um, left side line as we could put it to get as far away from the wetlands as we could. Um, there was a peer review by Lucas Engineering. Lucas Environmental, and we, based on that, the plans were revised to show a um, recharge area for um, the roof drains, as as well as allow the proposed sump pump a place to discharge instead of discharging over the ground. the uh, The lot is so flat that we couldn't get the uh, foundation drain to to flow to daylight on the property, so we're showing a sump pump. And it, uh, and it was suggested that we put it into the recharge area. So we resized the recharge area, provided calculations and detail of uh, how it was to be constructed. And uh, the, that is my letter addressing the comments. And so uh, one of the things was um, we had submitted an original wetland report by Goddard, but it hadn't been revised for, to reflect the changes that were made with the site walk. So this is the revised one that she's going through now. Also, um, when we had done a previous notice of intent for a lot six on Hayden Row Street, um, Goddard had done a cumulative impact to the, because of the, the, um, the entire area mm -hmm. and how it was affected by the development of the lots that have been developed. So he updated that to include this particular parcel and um, and so we've included that in our in our in our sub submission. So it's us work within the buffer. Uh, the other thing is the other, one of the other issues was um, apparently there was a uh, submittal for a determination of applicability across the street. That area that you see there that's, that's pretty clear. Um, it went right up to the. Um, we have to a driveway that was there across the street. So we uh, we looked at yeah, right up we yeah, went up to that it went up to that house yeah, in that area there. So um, we looked at what was the potential for what the the worst case scenario might be for in a buffer across the street and we've added that to the plan. But and here again it is on the other side of the paved road and there is no literal way that the uh, runoff from our site would get to that site because there are roadway ditches on both sides of the road but that collect runoff. So we provide erosion control. We've shown a detail of the erosion control and the um, limit of work is, is as I say, uh, everything is, is between the 100 and the 100 and the 50 foot buffer. Mm -hmm. No work being proposed outside the 100 foot buffer. Not, the 50 foot buffer, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um,
So this was part of the 10 acre parcel that was divided into the six ANR frontage lots in 2001. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Um, so Don, can we uh, just go back to the site plan, please? Yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So my thought is on this, um, you know, fairly significant portion of the house you know, in part of the garage. Or all of the garage. It looks like, you know, it's between the 50 and the 100 foot buffer zone. Mm -hmm. And it's a four bedroom house. I mean, is there any way that, I mean, my sense is, is that, you know, you're trying to fit too much into the small lot, you know, considering the resource area and the constraints. Um, yeah, I think if it was, you know, a small, what, what what's the square footage in the house? Uh, about about 3,000 square feet. Okay. The roof around the roof area is 3,000 square feet, so and that includes the garage, yeah. No, it, it does, yes. Okay, as far as as far as the, the square footage of them, yes. Um, okay, all right. Let me let me open it up to the other commission members, um, for their comments and question or comments and questions at this point through the chair. Yes, Ted. I'm going to pick up where you trailed off. Um, I think there's an immense amount of incursion inside the 100 foot buffer. A lot of it is, is not even necessary. Um, I live in a house without a garage. I don't see a garage as necessary. I live in a house without a deck. I don't see a deck as necessary. And all that lawn area to go right up next to the 50, all of that seems very unnecessary to me. And it would be difficult for me to vote yes on this proposal. Uh, I think that it needs to be redesigned to fit much more outside the 100 buffer, make the driveway smaller, move things out further, make the house smaller. Um, this is, in its presentation, a pretty solid no-go for me the way it is right now. OK, thank you. Yeah, this is Janine. I, I agree. It's just uh, too much for me uh, in the buffer zone. It's as you said, it's a, it's a little bit too much for this size lot with its current constraints. Okay, thanks, Janine. Well, Through the chair? Yes, Don. Um, I don't know if the applicant has requested any relief from um, zoning board in regards to the, the setbacks. They asked for relief, they might be able to get the house closer to the street and further away from the resource areas. Yeah, so I think that's uh, uh, something that needs to be explored. And to Janine and Ted's point, uh, you know, I echo their comments. I kind of wanted to let the other commission members voice their opinions before I, uh, um, you know, weighed in. But you know, I, I feel the same way. I think there's just too much house, too much lawn area. Um, you know, I think this can be tightened up so that there isn't as much uh, disturbance of the buffer zone. Um, you know, this is a, the smallest out of the lots um, that were approved. Um, so I think you guys, uh, the applicant needs to do a little bit more work to kind of tighten this up. Um, Matt, did you have any? Uh, yeah. This is Melissa. Um, just a quick comment on the groundwater. Um, is that an elevation of 98, the, the high groundwater estimate? Yes, we actually did a test pit. We actually did a test pit to determine the, the water table. 
Um, I would just right. be a little concerned about the groundwater um, and how that's going to work with the, the pumping. I'm just looking at the wetland and it's at elevation 102, 103, which kind of indicates that the groundwater's, you know, pretty high. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of ground water pumping potential for that, that basement. I'm just wondering about the well, we, I mean, we, as I said, we did a test pit on the lot right in the middle. Of, we can see it's right in the middle of the garage where it shows the garage. Mm -hmm. uh, we found groundwater at 98. The, the, uh, the proposed slab of the house is two and a half feet above that. So found groundwater at 98. Um, yeah, elevation 98. And when, when were those test pits done? Uh, they were done last spring, I think. So is the house going to have a basement or is it going to be a, a, you know, slab? No, it's a house. It's a basement. It's a full it's basement. A, okay. Okay. Uh, to, to Melissa's point, there's a high groundwater elevation. You know, we, I think, you know, my, if memory serves, Oh, it says July on the test pit. So that was in the middle of the drought. July 28th. Yeah, but, but they performed in accordance. We, so, we, you know, it's, it's modeling that you saw. We, we, you know, you don't need to have, you, it's based on, on rust line and modeling. Okay, these. well, that, that was my question. It just says groundwater elevation. I didn't know if that was the seasonal that they determined from models or... Um, yeah, well, we'll make, we can submit observe. soil evaluation form. So. Or, 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 you know, we test again now. Groundwater is pretty high right now. So if we, if we have to go out there and do another test, we can do another test this time of year. Because I'm finding it high everywhere we've been going lately. Mm -hmm. Okay, Matt, did you have any uh, further comments? Uh, <clears throat> no, I think... Uh, the majority of my comments or my initial memo um, were, were addressed in the revised submittal. Um, I think the only thing that I would comment on was in the revised buffer zone analysis. I don't know if the buffer zone that extends from the other side of the street was included in those calculations. And I don't know if that's something that you want to see those numbers be, you know, 100% accurate. I don't, I don't believe it was included, but I can be corrected if need be. But that was really the only outstanding item um, that I saw. Okay, thank you, Matt. I think Mr. Wells is on the call. Yeah, that uh, that was um, not included. The, the across the street buffer zone was not included in the analysis. Okay, um, was there a reason why it wasn't included? Uh, just, I didn't have that on the plan at the time when I did the analysis. I, that wasn't a part of the um, what I had before me, so I, I didn't realize where that line was going to end up. So, looks okay. pretty negligible to me. You know, would, um, just when I analyzed the change of, of considering this lot with the previous analysis that was done on on the the three lots a few years ago, it mm -hmm. only you know the only over basically the, the percentages of buffer zone impact changed pretty negligibly. So, you know, I'm happy to add in a few square feet, but it might not even change this, any of the numbers more than a, a decimal point. So. Okay. All right. Well, take a look at it. I mean, if it's negligible, I, I think that's fine. Um, you know, if we're talking very insignificant um, changes to the analysis, you know, that I, I think that's fine, but if you can take a look at it, uh, sure. Just to verify that, that would be great. Okay, questions or comments from the audience at this point? All right, so we have a little bit more work we need to do, folks. Um, so our next meeting would be February 9th um, or February 23rd to continue it out to what would be a preference. Um, I, we should be able to have something by the ninth. 
Okay. So we'll continue it to the ninth. And if you can just uh, forward uh, Don an email, please, just uh, memorializing that request. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Nation Zero Wood Street. This is a continuation of a notice of intent for an access roadway. Yeah. Good evening, Scott Goddard is here from Goddard Consulting. Joe Marquardt is also Goddard. on the phone. How you doing? And uh, the nations are also on the phone as well, who is the applicant. So you got the whole, the whole team here. Okay, good. All right, so I saw um, Lucas had put a review letter together. I saw that you had responded to that, Mr. Goddard. You just kind of want to walk us through, you know, the comments that Lucas had in your uh, response to those. I think that'd be a good starting point. Yeah, we can do that. And, and, if, and if it makes sense, I'm able to share my screen, certainly if it helps me to present plans uh, or if you could have, you know, Don do it as well, um, we can do it either way. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start walk, talking through the, the comments, but uh, maybe as I talk through them, it might be helpful to have a, a schematic up. I did, uh, we did get a, we did submit a, a revised package to Lucas uh, several weeks ago, and we got a response letter uh, up from this today. So I can walk through what we submitted, uh, but more importantly, the comments uh, in response from, from Matt. The, um, okay, which document you gonna do? I was gonna go through, Don, the Lucas letter. Does that make sense? Yeah. I guess we can, that's the one that we can hit that. So the first comment regarding the delineation is no further comment. The, the second question, point two, this was the question about, okay, so what's the purpose of the crossing? If you are able to, Don, bring back up the graphic of the proposal. Again, also I could share my screen. Yep, that's, that's perfect. So the upper part of the site that you plan that you see right there is where we're proposing the wetland replication. That's immediately adjacent to the existing wetland replication for Whisper, right? And then the driveway goes further down on that site plan. And uh, so you want to scan down a bit there, Don, to the, yep, yeah, okay, that, that's all. Yeah, there you go. So there's the, there's the proposed crossing on the wetland to get out to a new lot that is behind the Whisperway subdivision. So the question became, what was the purpose of it? So at this point, we're identifying the purpose to be uh, some kind of field or agricultural use. For the purposes of this application, we demonstrated an area on that site plan to show something of an acre in size outside of all buffer zones. So that this would be, yep. So that, that plan's adequate, but um, what she, might, it might show shit better on sheet two, I think, Don. Yep, this one here. So the, right below the crossing, there's some labels that were added by Mark Renat in an area demarcated as 41,350 square feet, about an acre, just shy of an acre, where they would be proposed clearing of the trees and the land to provide some type of an agricultural use in order to access the back part of the property. So we've identified that as the, the project purpose um, at this time. Number three is the question about whether or not the wetland, that so-called wetland F as it's delineated, is a potential vernal pool and if so, what's the implications of the 125 foot buffer zone? So Don, could you maybe zoom in a little bit um, on the crossing area on this plan? It might be helpful. Yeah, that's good. So on the left-hand side of the sheet here, where the wetland kind of bumps out and where it says town of Hopkinson land, yep, all in there. 
that is a more of a flooded shrub swamp wetland. There's indications that the water floods foot, foot and a half deep for probably a significant duration in springtime events. There's never been a direct observation as to whether or not this area could qualify as a vernal pool. It is the origin of the intermittent stream that we're proposing the crossing to. Okay, so we're down gradient of that wetland, BBW area. Jurisdictionally, it's a bordering vegetative wetland like any other that floods and an intermittent stream either partially flows through it or discharges from it. And uh, Matt identifies that it could possibly characterize as a potential vernal pool. Um, our observations are indirect because we did not observe this during the vernal pool season, but there are enough characteristics to it that would make um, a professional like myself or Matt think that there is a possibility that there would be breeding of amphibians in this depressed portion of the wetland, which is the majority of the wetland uh, in the springtime season. So without identifying it necessarily as a PVP, because it's not mapped or there's no evidence direct uh, for it, the question becomes, well, what, what do we do with the 125 foot pr provision in your bylaw? If you slapped 125 feet off that area, it would certainly come across where we have our proposed crossing, okay? But the reason for the selection of this crossing is a couple fold as it pertains to the potential 125 foot buffer zone to the PVP area. One is that it falls on top of an existing cart path area, right? So we're not creating a new crossing, but this is a long-term footpath, ATV path, uh, et cetera, that, has cut, that cuts through the woods, through the wetland and crosses over the stream. So we're trying to utilize that existing disturbed area. It also fits the natural topography of the land. The land naturally goes in this area, so it's the least amount of regrading and earthwork to approach the wetland in there. It's the least amount of kind of a valley shape to it and all. And then, yeah, there you go, good. And so it doesn't require us to make a new path uh, or to, it limits our amount of fill. Furthermore, if you look at the plan that Dawn has up on the screen right now, if this whole system was to slide, this driveway system was to slide to the right, okay, that would put it further away from the potential PVP area. The downside to it, it, was, it would become a much wider wetland crossing. So we're at the narrow point of the wetland. It can be done. The wetland crossing could be put 125 foot from this um, larger depressional area of the wetland. But when you balance out all the interests, I'm still of the belief that this is the preferred location in order to minimize the BVW alterations. So no change in the orientation was proposed as a result of that comment. Point number four was, uh, let's see. Through the chair? Yeah, sorry. Yes, Matt. Um, I guess just a question on uh, a comment from uh, one of the earlier responses by Mr. Goddard um, of the, the land use to be some sort of an agricultural use. So I, I I guess just to follow up on that kind of line of thought, so that the road has been designed to meet planning board standards. Is that correct? Joe, can you comment on that? Joe Marquinot's on with us. Generally, it's the design provides the access that the fire chief has been looking for on all projects. But this is meant to meet his driveway guidelines. Okay, I, I guess my question would be is if it's agricultural use, it strikes me that, you know, is that what was presented to the fire department for the requirements of the road width? Because it seems like an agricultural use would be much different than a residential or commercial or some other use. I don't know that for sure. It just would strike me that you don't necessarily need a 20 foot wide road with all the bells and whistles to access I don't know, a cornfield. I don't know what it's going to be. Well, the fire chief is going to ask for 12 foot surface and two foot shoulder on either side. He's going to look for a 16 foot wide envelope through there at a minimum. That's been in place since 2017, May of 2017. 
So we simply provide a grass strip and then the walls to hold up the crossing given the grades in that area. That's even for an agricultural use? Correct. Anything the chief needs to access with his, with his vehicles. Okay, that was all I had for now. Joe, while you're on the, on the call here, could you comment on his point number four as well, which is Matt's next comment, which is about the review of the stormwater management system, potentially by others. Is, has that been reviewed, uh, Joe? And do you know if there's been any comment from uh, technical comments on your stormwater design? I am not aware of any. No, it, it actually hasn't been reviewed. And we, you know, Don and I had talked about this. Um, and we wanted to um, just hold off on the stormwater review for now. Uh, when we had talked about this a couple weeks ago, just because we didn't want to ask the applicant to go forward with the stormwater review um, before we had a, you know, more of an opportunity to kind of vet this out um, to see, you know, where uh, directionally it was going with the commission. So, you know, we, we, we just wouldn't want the applicant to spend the money um, until we had, you know, further clarity on, you know, what, where the project was going and, you know, whether it was, you know, permittable in, in our view. So that was kind of the, the sense. Okay. okay. So point number five from the Lucas letter was asking for the stream crossing standards calculations to be provided on the site plan. Th those are provided here in the letter and no further comment is needed. So we do meet the openness ratio. We meet the bank full width of 1.2 times average width for the eight foot wide uh, culvert that's proposed across that stream. Point chair. number six was- Sorry, Scott. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Scott, ahead, through the chair? Yes, Matt, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so I just, I know I said no further comment. I guess I do have one one other small comment on that is the, you know, the, the, um, the open notes ratio is 0 0.84 um, and agree that's greater than the 0 0.82. Um, but as mentioned, that is the minimum, um, the optimal um, openness ratio in the stream crosses standards is quite a bit more than that 1.64. So again, just sort of in full disclosure of, of what's being presented. So the commission realizes it's, it does meet it, but it's meet at the absolute minimum, um, not anywhere near the optimal. Um, yeah, the, the stream crossing standards do have these sort of levels of compliance, right? The minimum standards is the, the, the d target design for permissibility. More than that is, you know, kind of gravy as it were. And uh, there's always room to make a larger openness ratio simply by enlarging the culvert. So if we, if we instead of having two and a half feet of, of clearance of on our culvert here, if this lifted up another foot, for example, of course our openness ratio would go up substantially. And that would just mean bring the road up a foot, additional foot of fill, that kind of thing. So, you know, this is the design standard that the regulations called for. And we wanted to make sure that it was fully satisfied. So we can say, you know, confidently that this design does meet the stream crossing standards. As Matt says, the minimum required uh, threshold for openness. Point number six was a discussion of alternatives. Uh, that was an expansion upon a prior alternatives analysis submitted with the original application. This was a more expansive alternatives analysis to talk about uh, different ways to approach. We sort of talked about it a little bit earlier with the PVP discussion. Could there be um, alternate design methods to have larger crossings, um, different, different orientations of the access road, et cetera. So that was discussed in the written alternatives analysis. And the Lucas comment was for the commission to discuss if the alternatives analysis was, was adequate. Um, we could walk through all those alternatives if, if you'd like, but I'd, I'd rather try to get through the balance of the letter and then decide if it's something you wanna circle back to. Yeah, let's do that, Scott. Let's Point number on. seven then, um, this is the, okay, so on the site plans, 
there is a utility conduit showed, a buried utility conduit outside the footprint. If you, if you zoom in, Dawn, on the crossing itself, you'll see what's labeled as ETC on the right-hand side of the crossing, which is what that designates a buried trench in the ground. It is within the erosion control barriers, but it is outside of the footprint of the roadway itself. So no additional wetland impact beyond what is um, shown and accounted for in this plan would be triggered by that, that utility conduit. Point number eight is a discussion of satisfying the, the standards and particularly- Sorry, whether Scott. Not... Sorry, Scott, to interrupt yeah, you one more time. Mm -hmm. um, so just back to, to number um, seven, I, I don't, I'm not sure that you kind of addressed my question, which was is some reason why that utility can't be within the actual roadway footprint. Joe, are you going to comment on that? Generally, it has uh, issues to do with the construction of the block walls. We need the uh, grid membrane to extend um, into the uh, driveway in order to provide support for the stacked block walls. The concern was as we lay that grid membrane, if we are in conflict with the utilities during construction, if we are in conflict long-term, if there's ever, ever any reason to get back to the utilities, it seemed to make more sense to be outside um, the driveway proper in the work area outside the walls to put that conduit in, that there'd be less long-term concerns about the stability of that block wall if the membrane were left in place and, and no accommodations have to be made to install the utility. Could the conduit just be attached to the side of the, of the crossing? That's certainly done fairly routinely. Potentially, I, I think I'd have to review that with the uh, folks that provide the, the, the power to make sure that's an acceptable alternative. This isn't taking water or anything where it has to be buried for frost reasons, correct? No, at this point, it, it's simply power. Okay. So if we go, if we go back to point number eight, this is a question about performance standards and whether or not it's appropriate to classify this project as a limited project. Now, um, I think Matt makes a good point here on number eight for sure. And if Don, if you could go, can you go, go back to the site plan, um, particularly the sheet that shows where the replication area is proposed? I think it's the further up. Um, yeah. So if we look at where the replication area is proposed, it's not within the immediate, that's, that's it right there. So the, the, the darker shaded area is the existing replication area that was done for Whisper Way. The hatched area right above it is what's proposed for this project. And again, the logic here was to propose a wetland replication area immediately adjacent to our fill area is certainly doable, okay? But there's a fairly nice natural buffer zone in that area with healthy, mature trees, undisturbed conditions, et cetera. And you know, there's 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 often there's some conflicting thoughts about about meeting all the standards by the letter of the law versus the intent of it could maybe be satisfied by replicating elsewhere in order to preserve um, what's a good and viable buffer zone on on the immediate proximity to the site. So I propose to put it in this location here for access, existing disturbed conditions improvements, etc. But to Matt's point, the standards for re wetland replication do call for it to be similar locations, similar elevations, similar hydrology, those kind of things then as what's being lost. And since we're not strictly doing that, it is maybe more appropriate to call this project out as a limited project because um, it gives the commission more flexibility to uh, approve that replication in, in an alternate location because it's and limited in its ability of fully meeting the standards as, as outlined in 1055-4B. So the 1053 3E limited project standards could apply in this case and allow the commission to approve the alternate location for wetland replication. So I'm perfectly fine 
classifying this as a limited project uh, to that end. Okay, I think that makes sense. Number nine is there was some references in, in the narrative and replication plan to. Uh, oh, sorry, that, this is the this is the uh, bank issue. This is was this is identifying that we're we're not replicating bank per se. The alter alteration to the bank. There will be a limited amount of replication of bank inside the culvert. So, but that doesn't have all the same functions and values because some of it will lack vegetation and whatnot. So when it's possible, there's a desire to replicate bank in an alternate location. We're not replacing BBW, but bank is not required to be uh, replicated at a one-to-one -one linear foot ratio. So we're just acknowledging that there's not bank replication per se. There is a degree of bank restoration inside the culvert. Number 10, is okay so this is the uh, the issue of where we're proposing the uh, the off i don't want to call it off-site replication but in some sense is off-site just the indirect location of the replication area and whether or not we're taking away from existing approved mitigation for the whisperway project in order to now do a, additional mitigation for this project and yes it's true the area that is was proposed for whisperway to be part of the buffer zone restoration project, which is that whole field where the house is coming down, et cetera. That is where the work is proposed for this, for this um, wetland replication. Now, long-term, this will be a forested wetland upland system in this whole area. So Matt's comment was, can you look for, for some additional mitigation, maybe in the area where the house is coming down, et cetera. So if, you, if we go back to the Whisper Way project, what we'll see is that, in fact, we max out that area. We did far above and beyond replication um, and re restoration of buffer zone all the way to that house, all the way to the extent of the 100 foot buffer zone is all being restored into upland, upland buffer. So we've maxed out um, um, mitigation measures over there. And, you know, ab like I said, above and beyond. So I think doing this additional mitigation uh, over there for a couple thousand square feet of additional um, BBW addition isn't, doesn't not hurt or harm in any way the ability for the, that whole area that we're improving to provide all the functions and values of a forested upland wetland ecosystem. Number 11 is about... Um, This is the invasive species comment. So there was a typo in the report of the replication plan to talking about invasive species where we don't have invasives um, on the plan. So one typo reference of invasives does, does remain in that, in that report that you know, can and should be corrected. But all the procedures for how to monitor and create the wetland replication area would be identical to that of Whisper Way because it really would just be an expansion of the protocol that we have over there. Um, number 13 was no further comment. And number 14 is, uh, oh, that's going to the DEP comments. So the last section was just DEP making a couple of comments. And I think all that has already been covered uh, in what we've discussed. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much the the Lucas letter in, in summation. We can go through any of it in more detail if you'd like. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, with regard to the, um, the area, the upland area that's being, you know, that this, um, crossing is providing access to. Um, so the proposed use is for, you know, agricultural purposes. Okay. Um, you know, to Matt's point, uh, you know, it just seems like this is a fairly, uh, um, this is a fairly um, comprehensive crossing to access, you know, 
an agricultural area. So I guess, you know, the question to the applicant is, you know, if we were to approve this, I think, you know, my sense is that it would be conditioned that, you know, there's no resource area or buffer zone disturbance um, that would be allowed on that parcel, you know, so you would have access to the, uh, you know, you'd have the, the crossing to the, um, to the parcel, and then you would have the ability to, um, you know, work within the area that's in upland, but not in buffer zone. So that, that, that would be my sense with that. Um, so, you know, because, and again, you know, we, I mean, Mr. Guy, you've done enough of these projects in town and the nations have, you know, we look at cumulative impacts. That's a big factor in, you know, the, the, the process. Um, so without having that, you know, if we were to go forward and approve the crossing, I think it's reasonable for the commission to, you know, limit the work that would be allowed on that parcel to work um, outside the buffer zone. Um, so that's my comment there. And just, you know, with regard to the stormwater, you know, that still needs to be reviewed, but we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, directionally the, the applicant was okay with where we were going with this, you know, before we uh, requested beta to um, go in and review it and, and, and incur those fees. So um, that's the comments I have. For right now, I'll open it up to the other commission members for their questions and comments. Jeff, this is Jim. I yes. just have a, I just have a, a small question. Does this, uh, does this crossing somehow provide access to the open space, uh, either what the town owns already or what is coming from the project? Does this, you know, so does this open up more access to the open space? So if you look at that plan, the town owns what well, you can't see, right? Town owns uh, U U9 580. And then on your plan, uh, there's uh, open space indicated. Is that now open space or is it to be open space? So along 495 and, um, and there's another place. Where the plan notes it as open space. I'm just wondering, is that existing or it's going to be open space when the project's all done? The Whisper Way project. Does that make any sense? Two questions. One, where it says open space on the plan that's on the screen now, is that existing open space or is it going is it future open space? The second question is if you're allowed to do this crossing, does it give access to either existing open space that the town owns or anything new? Uh, Ron that Nation, can I answer uh, that? Or? Yeah, yes, yeah. Mr. Nation, go ahead. So, I, I think that the crossing will end up giving access to a great deal of open space in the future. Um, that's, that's, that's all I can say. I'm not sure exactly what, um, well, what Jim is what Jim was referring to, but um, I believe that in, at some point in the in the future that there will be a large amount of open space from this parcel um, available or accessed by that crossing. Yeah, so I, yeah, that's my question. Thank uh, you. Does it open up, you know, to uh, to more open space? Thank you. So I think the answer to the your first question, Jim, I think that that area designated as town of Hopkinton is, is uh, open that's space. Existing. That's, that's, currently, that's currently owned by the town and is, is existing, right? Right, but there's, a, there's an area, there's a note along 495 that says open space, and then I thought there was another one, but I can't find it. Because I know it's part of Whisper Way, Ron, uh, you're conveying some part of it to the town for open space, right? Um, well, the land I'm, I'm talking about is outside of, of Whisper Way, the Whisper Way property, and it would be um, land that, in my view, at this time, 
would be would be added to the could be added to the town forest or just simply called open space for yeah. whatever occurs in that in that parcel. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, questions or comments from other commission members? Sure. Through the chair. Yes, Ted. Um, I would like to to echo Jeff what you said about if this is granted, there needs to be zero further uh, impacts on wetlands. Nonetheless, I still struggle with approving a bridge to now virtually nowhere. Uh, the the description of what that land will be used to is so vague that it makes it really difficult for me to approve a crossing of that size and scope. Um, I do agree that if there is approval, I would follow exactly what you said, Mr. Chair. I don't know that I'm ready to approve without having more detail about what that land is gonna be used for. Okay, thank you. Yes, Carrie. So I have the same reservations. It just, it, it's kind of boggling my mind why you would invest so much in infrastructure and utilities with the paved road and, and electricity you know, to something we don't know what they're gonna use it for or agriculture. Um, it just has my spidey sense tingling and it feels a little, I don't know. Um, so I'm not inclined to approve it until I have a better idea of what the, the real purpose, the future purpose is gonna be, especially cause it's, it's such um, infrastructure. But that being said, if the applicant decides that they wanna move forward with this, you know, that's up to them. I would, if that's the case, um, because this is quite a, an impact for whatever purpose, I would like to see, you know, full compliance with the stream crossing standards. Um, I would like to see something in writing from the fire department rather than the assumption that they're gonna have to. It doesn't seem um, like what Matt was saying easy. It just doesn't seem like you would need to do a full with paved road if it's not gonna have structures on the other side. Um, I wouldn't think that the fire department would even be so concerned if there was no structures over there to protect. So. Um, yeah, there's just a couple of like unanswered things I would like to see the utilities in the roadway. I think we'd all like, why would you run electricity, but now no water sewer? Um, well, it's septic, but uh, it just, I don't know, it seems a little odd. Okay, thank you. Right, okay. Through, the, through the chair, this is Melissa. Um, I think if we were gonna make a decision on it, I'd, I'd have to make any decision based on the assumption that it wasn't just agriculture, that this was gonna be um, potentially anything developed there, uh, you know, residential, um, whatever, I, you know, th that, that I think would be my assumption um, if we were voting on it. Um, and, you know, normally we like to see a whole the whole picture. So if we don't see the whole picture, then I would agree that um, the expectation would be to not be touching any buffers, any, everything would have to be out of it upland unless we had the additional detail of what's actually gonna, gonna go there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, would you like to hear maybe from Mr. Nation to explain a little further his agricultural intent or you know, some, you know, I mean, Ron, is are you able to comment on your proposed use out there this time? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> the, uh, the, I guess my, the broadest statement I can make is that it, that it'll be used for any lawful purpose. And um, I have no intention of going back to the CONCOM. I think everything that, that is done out there in the future would be outside of the buffer zone and um, any lawful purpose. So if I need a permit for something to whatever I'm going to do out there, um, I'm going to apply for the permit. If the permit is denied, it's denied. If I'll, 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 I'll do something different. But at this time, I think agricultural is uh, pretty much covers it. And um, I stay out of the wetlands, any lawful purpose. I, I, I only want to want to, uh, to obtain access to my property. Um, absent that, there is no purpose to the property. So here I am. And um, 
And the, the extent of, the, of this crossing is it's a 12 foot crossing which, with two feet on either side. So um, that is what the fire department requires for pretty much access to anything. But that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the requirement for a driveway. So that this is got block walls on either side is true. And it's crossing a stream, a small stream. That's true. And um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I, it just seems, seems like a man is entitled to access to his property. I'm here to apply for the permit. There are standards for that. I'm applying, I'm conforming to all of the standards and, and I don't intend to do any further work within the buffer zone. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what folks are so afraid of. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know, as, as long as we're under the uh, understanding that, you know, there's not going to be any uh, work permitted by the commission, uh, you know, in the buffer zone or the, or the wetland resource areas, um, you know, on that section of the property, you know, after this is approved, uh, then I think we're fine with that, Mr. Nation, um, you know. It's just that if, you know, if there was a situation where it was residential and there was going to be potential future impact, for the public, then, then we like to see that those cumulative impacts, you know, presented as one package, if you will. But, you know, if your so, objective is to stay out of the buffer zones, you know, in that portion of the property going forward, then, you know, we would just condition that as part of the approval. Um, and I, you know, I think that, uh, that, that is certainly my intent my intent, Mr. Chairman, okay. and um, I will, you know, we can, can, we'll, we'll go over it with a fine tooth comb um, in, in tomorrow, but I don't believe that there is a single square foot that we need that, that I, that I have any interest in. And, um, I, and I, I believe that's the case. Okay. All right. Hey, that, that's good, it's good for that clarification. Oh. So yeah. Yes, Jim, go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, since we're talking about uh, whether we could accept it or not, I, I look at this as two pieces. The first piece is this one before us. And then what comes next is, as Mr. Nation said, something that's a separate project and we would, he would submit an application, we, we, we would review, the, review it then. If nothing happens up there, if he decides he's just going to do this and not do anything in the, in the other property, uh, maybe it's still a good thing because we have access to some open space that we don't have access to right now. So I think that we should, I think that we should, um, you know, look at this as a single project. The next project, if there is one, will be under separate application. Well, we, we have to, you know, again, going back to the cumulative impacts, Jim, that's kind of what we're. Yeah, no, I, no, I understand that. I understand that. Right. So. So if we approve, so if we approve this, there's not going to be a future application before the commission because this would be conditioned that you know there's not going to be any disturbance in the buffer zone or wetland resource areas and in, in you know the, the in the you know going forward in the other portion of the site. So okay, yes, Ted, go ahead. I would just like to respectfully push back on Jim. I would say if we approve this and then there was no development, why in the world did we have this significant impact in the wetlands? If there's not access to open space. Let me finish, Jim. That's the reason I'm interested in knowing why are we making something this big? There is access to that right now. If you put on some hip boots and walk. There can be access to it if you put in the kind of crossing we allow Boy Scouts to put in all the time. It's not our without problem. knowing, but it is our wetlands to protect. And yeah, if it's, it's our wetlands, to protect, boots on walk through this why are you interrupting me? Please stop interrupting. It's our I'm wetlands sorry. to protect, and we have approved all sorts of different wetland crossings because we had a sense what was going on with the whole project. If we were to improve, uh, approve such a large crossing and then nothing happens, I think we, we would regret approving that kind of crossing for a bridge to nowhere. 
Uh, through the chair? Yes, Mr. Nation. I guarantee you something will happen and you'll be happy with it. We're not gonna build a crossing to nowhere and we will use the land and we will not impact the wetlands in any, any further way. We will not be back for, for another notice of intent. I, it, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how else to how, no. how else to say it. I don't want to access my property with hip boots. I would prefer to drive over there. And if it, if anybody has any problem out there, that I think the fire chief and the police in the uh, fire department would like to be able to get out there and, and help somebody. And and that's and, and this is the stream crossing. This is the crossing. These 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 are what I'm trying to comply with is your regulation. So uh, don't don't. Don't blame. I would. I wish I could do a, a simple little crossing here, and it'd be great. But that's not how it works today. Okay. Um, so I, you know, when you go through this with your fine tooth comb tomorrow, yes, you know, sir. just take take a look at the crossing as well to make sure that, um, you know, that's going to be what you guys need going forward. You know, in turn, you know, there's the electrical part of it. You know, for the utilities. There's no water or sewer at this point. So just make sure that, you know, that's not going to be something that, um, or maybe it is, you know, you just haven't contemplated it yet, but, um, you know, just take a look at that. And then uh, to Mr. Nation, you know, I, I guess it may probably make sense at this point to have beta do the stormwater review portion of it. Um, so is that, uh, is that something you would like us to go forward with? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. We'll need uh, further consultant fees to uh, address that. Do you have a Do you have an estimate from them, Don? I think they did submit it, right? Yeah, I can. Uh, I can dig that up. Uh, yeah, can just... you forward that to Mr. Nation? Yes, I can. Okay. Great. Sure. Okay. Um, so any other questions or comments from the commission at this point? Um, I still have one more comment. Yes, I just, Carrie. I guess I'm just finding a little confusing because at one thing, at the beginning of the presentation, Mr. Goddard said the intended use was agricultural, but then Mr. Nation seems to say like he has some intended use. Is there a clarification like that? There's intended use that's only in uplands, not in jurisdictional areas or on the property. It felt like a mixed message, and maybe I was the only one that, missed, that interpreted it that way. Yeah, as I as I understand it, you know, that could be. Well, it sounds like there's several things they're contemplating, but whatever it is that you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be in any jurisdictional area um, that the commission would need to approve going forward. That is correct. So it would be an up one. Chair? Yes, Matt. Um, so I just want to clarify that the, the wetland boundaries haven't been approved through that all through wetland F. And um, obviously the, the presence or absence of the, of the vernal pool in wetland F could affect the limits of the jurisdiction as well. So just for the record, um, you know, that would need to be sorted out to determine if work is or is not occurring within jurisdictional areas in the future. Okay, thank you, Matt. Okay, uh, so questions or comments from the public at this point? Let me just scroll through, see if anyone has their hand raised. All right, doesn't look like anyone has any comments or questions. All right, so our next two meetings are the 9th and the 23rd. Um, I doubt that beta will, uh, it's the 26th. I, it'd probably be a stretch to have beta review this and get their comments back before the 9th would be my guess. Don, would you agree with that or? Yeah, because uh, I we, we'd want to make sure we'd have enough uh, uh, funds at hand to, to pay them when they bill us. Yeah, so I think the 23rd would probably make sense to continue this out too. Uh, is that okay? Mr. Nation? Yes, uh, 
I'm sorry, I missed that. It's the, so continuing it out to the next hearing, um, I was just saying the our next meeting is the ninth, but I don't think that beta will have enough time between now and the ninth to get their review done, the report together, um, for you to respond adequate, adequately before that meeting. So I would recommend probably the 23rd. Okay, if we got our information by the 9th, would we, would we have a, a substantial meeting on the 23rd, do you think, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, Yeah, that sounds I think, perfect. I don't think it needs to be in by the 9th. You know, if you get it into us, um, you know, the week before the, the 23rd, you know, a week and a half before the, the 23rd, um, that should give us adequate time to take a look at it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, and if you can just send Don an email, please, uh, putting that. Yep, I'll do that right now. Extension in writing. Yep, I'm doing that right now. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Have a good evening. You too. Okay. So Mastriani, Zero South Street, this is a continuation of a notice of intent to construct a commercial building. Yep, so Scott Goddard again, Goddard Consulting, John Cusich is on the phone from Bowler Engineering, along with Paul Mastriani and Kathy Sherry from REC Hopkinton as the applicant. Don, um, if you're able to, I did send you an email just shortly ago with a, an updated colored site plan that would make a good graphic for presentation purposes. Since the last public hearing on this, we submitted a fairly substantial package of revised information that was submitted last week. We haven't, um, I understand Matt, you know, hasn't had a chance to issue an updated letter, but perhaps, um, you know, can we can have some verbal dialogue on his thoughts on that package tonight. I'll, I'll kind of give you the highlights of it because it's basically there's like a nine page response to his letter, which I don't know if we want to go through that point by point it might take a long time. And then there's attachments which are, you know, substantial in size. So I'm going to give you the kind of the highlight issues and then we can kind of dig in as you want to beyond that. Sounds good. If Don's able to pull that uh, plan up, that would be that would be great while I start talking through it. I'm going to need a little time because I, I got to put it on the uh, the website and the web link so the public can see the stuff you just emailed me. So I need okay. a little time. Okay. It would have been helpful if I had this before the meeting. So the the here's the update. So there's a, there's a 119 21. So provided. just uh, before you start, Scott, do you have the plan that you can uh, screen share? Well, Don's working. I have on. it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I can screen share. All right. Um, Let me. So I think it would be helpful. So I think you should you should be able to bring it up. Yeah. Give me one second. Okay. Okay, good. So this is the updated site plan colored up for everybody. Okay, since the last meeting, a fair number of things have happened that I think have brought this project a far away toward conclusion. There's been some dialogue with the planning board. Um, and I would say that the big thing that came out of the planning board meeting from a wetland impact perspective is that they were insistent on having sidewalks on the access road. The sidewalks added um, 51 or 53 square feet of additional impact area uh, in the footprint of the crossing. At that meeting, myself and the engineer and the applicant, we requested to not have it for the purposes of minim minimizing wetland impact. But from a pedestrian traffic flow, kind of master planning perspective of safety, et cetera, they, the planning board was insistent on having the sidewalk. So this plan now has been updated to have 
what I would now reclassify as the minimum acceptable with the planning board as the regs refer to it for a crossing of, of wetlands. The other big change that came out since the last meeting was the addition of a stormwater management feature to capture some of the runoff that comes off the adjacent parking lot. And as you remember this, the neighboring parking lot to the left here does have some encroachment of pavement onto our site. And we have this existing little depression isolated wetland that we're altering and filling for the purposes of this project. Largely, all that does is capture some of the stormwater that runs off of, of this parking lot. It's full of European buckthorn almost exclusively. It's not really that impressive of an isolated wetland. But what we're proposing is something that recreates um, with a design intent stormwater management. So there's a, there's a grass swale for infiltration, for collection of sediments right off that parking lot edge here that's designed. Now it's not quite as big square foot to square foot as the isolated wetland, but it will function as an isolated wetland um, of its own um, because of the, the input of the hydrology from the adjacent lot. So what we were able to do with that is at the request of, of, of Matt and the commission was reduce the square footage of the wetland replication area to try to preserve as much upland buffer as possible by the reduction in um, the overall wetland impact by what we're creating with this little grass swale feature. So there's about a 30% reduction in overall size of replication. So we still meet the one and a half to one requirement from the crossing for the access road, plus the remaining land of the isolated vegetative wetland over, over here. So with that, we've updated almost every significant report that went along with this project. There's a, an, an updated wetland replication detail plan. There's a construction sequencing plan that was requested at the last meeting. There's some, um, some details about some of the vegetational buffers on this plan that you can see some of the landscaping features. Um, but one of the more important things that was a repeated comment in Matt's prior letters was the need for a wildlife habitat evaluation. So Dan Wells at my office, who's a wildlife biologist, he's on the call now if there's questions about the wildlife habitat, but he did do a comprehensive wildlife habitat study out here. And he found that the designs are adequate and appropriate to protect the somewhat commonplace wildlife habitat features that are found on the property. He could get into that in more detail. The one notable item that we added to the plan to accommodate wildlife habitat, though not required for passages of water, is that the, the culvert system through the crossing was upgraded from a 12 inch single culvert to convey water to now a twin 18 inch culvert. If you look at what's feeding the wetland where we're crossing, we just have this little bulb of wetlands right here. And there's a drain, there's a, there's a catch basin over here. Uh, actually, it's right there. That catch basin has a discharge pipe out to this wetland. So we're more or less this wetland, maybe there's some groundwater component discharge, but we have this kind of surface water collection system, dis pipe discharge feeding the wetland. Then we get some flow that kind of makes its way through this, this system and all. So there's not a whole lot going on in here from a wildlife habitat perspective. Nevertheless, for small animals, this crossing was upgraded to twin 18 inches, which will allow small mammals, amphibians, reptiles to pass through. The larger animals can pass over the, the driveway as such. That's why we've minimized the length of these, of these um, wing wall or retaining wall crossings. So there's, like I said, there's a whole package that goes through point by point Matt's comments. There's all these additional reports. There's, this is their additional plan. And, um, but I, but those things I just mentioned are the highlighted changes. So I'll stop there at this point, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Mr. Wells, did you just want to give us a kind of a brief uh, overview of the um, wildlife uh, habitat um, analysis that you did? Sure, Mr. Chairman. So as Scott mentioned, the, Essentially, there were no unique habitat features that are uncommon to the area. There's, you know, a lot of 
I'd, I'd say woody debris and leaf litter, which are pretty abundant, not just in the, the limit of work, but throughout the site. Um, what, what's most important, I think, to focus in on is, is first of all, the isolated vegetated wetland. And, you know, when you see a wetland like that, typically what comes to mind is looking for, could it be a vernal pool? That was, I think, vetted in the ANRAD process for this project, that it, it does not provide that function. Um, as Scott mentioned, it's pretty much dominated by invasive shrubs. There's some red maple tree canopy within it, but is, is you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Common within that. Okay, good. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so the next part, I think, of a significant part of the site to look at would be that wetland on the just to the left of the crossing as you're looking at the plan. Mm -hmm. And as Scott indicated, that the source of that wetland system, it, it just kind of originates right in that location. If, if there was undeveloped habitat up gradient of there, then there'd be the potential for kind of a significant wildlife habitat corridor running through there, through the crossing. But, you know, it's completely there's a large industrial building, the site to the left there. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, it's, you know, the entire street is significantly developed. So that, so I don't, as Scott indicated, you know, there's going to be, the crossing is going to provide, you know, ample size for small animals to move through that. But because of the fragmented, you know, the highly developed, landscape context, you know, in that vicinity, I don't see that as being a potential issue of, you know, interrupting a significant wildlife habitat corridor. Um, so I think that crossing is, is more than adequate to kind of provide migration for small mammals, small amphibians. Um, okay. If you look at the, the rest of the site, the, you know, just the buffer zone impact. There's certainly, there's some, a few dead standing trees. There's some woody debris on the ground. There's certainly going to be some impacts to common, you know, small mammals, birds, but there's nothing, you know, there's, it's not a site that has any sunny potential turtle nesting areas, um, despite being next to that, a pretty substantial sized wetland on the, to the right of the plan <clears throat> and exactly yeah so that's it's completely forested so there's no real concern about turtle nesting areas being impacted by this project um, so i think you know surrounding there's the buffer zone that's going to be left in place is going to provide habitat you know normal you know, for, for the common squirrels, things like that, small mammals, there's gonna be quite a bit of that habitat left undisturbed in the vicinity of this project. The, the large wetland to the right is going to be, you know, there may be some non-vernal pool amphibian breeding in there, but that's not gonna be affected. Um, you know, the project's maintaining the setbacks, 50 foot setbacks. So there's gonna be a pretty substantial strip of undeveloped habitat adjacent to that wetland. So overall, I would say that's, that's my assessment that it's be, although there, are, there will be some loss of common habitat types, habitat features, overall there's nothing unique and there won't be a significant decline in any existing wildlife populations. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Wells. All right, so Matt, um, you, I think need some more uh, or some additional time to go through this, but did you have any kind of preliminary comments um, based on the, the new uh, submittal by uh, Goddard? Um, yeah, just a couple, I guess, big picture items. I, I, I appreciate the effort to uh, address some of the comments that have been brought um, from myself and from the commission so far. I guess the 
you know, and I think we definitely made some movement on sort of the IVW mitigation issue. I guess my question would be, is there some reason why the IVW can't be fully mitigated in that area? It looks like there's room. And then secondly, sort of following up on that, rather than, because presumably you're building essentially a, a, a stormwater BMP to mitigate for the IVW, which I don't disagree with it entirely because I think the IVW is essentially serving that purpose, um, but potentially a little bit more than that. So will that BMP be part of the operations and maintenance plan and be regularly maintained? And if so, is it possible to just build something that would receive the drainage but become more of a sort of just turn into a natural feature, maybe with some sort of an overflow to control where the water goes, but fit it all in there and, and really be able to minimize the, the need for the BVW, you know, rather than lumping in still some of that IVW to the BVW area. So I think it just would provide more flexibility to build the BVW mitigation, you know, maybe in an area where we're really, you know, really minimizing taking down any large trees and kind of doing a bit more creatively. Um, and just to follow on that, I think the, I think there's still some plan work that needs to be done because it looks like none of the grading changed for the BVW mitigation. It looks like it was just sort of a section of it was truncated off for the plan, but I presume you have more work to do on that. Um, those were, I think, kind of my, I guess my, my big points. I have some other smaller things, but if, if the commission wants a, a written follow-up, then I'll, I'll include all that in uh, those comments in there. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So I, I, have, I have a couple of comments that I could respond to on that. And maybe John sure. might be able to pipe in on the sizing issue as well. But um, for the IVW, remember that's only regulated under the Wetland Protection Act, uh, sorry, the Wetland Bylaw in Hopkins, not the Wetland Protection Act. So if the goal is really is to minimize the amount of BBW uh, replication area to make that smaller to preserve buffer zone, we really only have to do one to one of BBW. And that would, that would comply with the Wetland Protection Act. It's only because of the bylaw that we one upgraded it to one and a half to one. And secondly, to accommodate for the IVW additional square footage. So the commission if they deemed the buffer zone preservation around the replication area to be important, that does have, in my opinion, the discretion to, to you know, modify that standard of the, of the application thereof. As far as the square foot to square foot for the IVW to the new water quality feature, um, I think there's some size and engineering limitations to it, but maybe the better way to look at it isn't so much a square foot to square foot kind of analysis, but more of a function to function analysis. If it's functioning strictly as a stormwater management feature and we're capturing by design the, the, the water volume in its entirety, then we could, I think we could reasonably make the argument that the functions are being preserved and improved in their entirety, even if the square footages don't match up exactly. Um, so those would be a couple of thoughts I had on that. But John might have a couple of comments as to how the sizing of that um, water quality feature is that was done and how, where and how the limitations come about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Scott. And, and I, I think you hit the, 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 the key items, but just relative to the, the, the sizing, uh, the sizing that was, was chosen for the, um, uh, the, the, the filter strip, I'll call it, was just based on treating one inch of water off of the parking lot that drains to it. Um, we didn't want to make it larger than it needed to be because that would result or require us to essentially extend it closer, you know, into the, the, the buffer zones of the, of the BBW. So what we wanted to do was to really provide the one inch of, um, of treatment area to, to handle the, the parking lot flow, but also to be uh, respectful of the buffer zones on, on either side, the, the north and the south. Uh, if the commission would prefer us to make that a little bit larger, we, we certainly have the room to do that, but would be extending a little bit closer into those buffer zones, which we thought probably didn't make sense here, but we certainly can do that if, um, if our- I, 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 would, I would agree with that, Mr. Cusack. I think it's, uh, 
I think minimizing the buffer zone disturbance, uh, you know, if that's functioning um, effectively, you know, as designed um, and, is, and is able to treat the uh, flow that's generated from the site, I, I think that's fine. Yep. Chair? Yes, Matt. But the other alternative would be to remove some of the pavement if you, if you were looking for additional air. You could remove pavement rather than going into buffer zone, correct? I don't think that's something that's that's realistic. If, you know, the butter is using that, even though it happens to be on our, our property, it's it's still his his parking lot. And so it's not it's not as though it's just pavement that's that's sitting there. It's actually being utilized. So we're really trying to respect that, not get into a legal battle with the buffer and provide something that really meets the intent of what you'd want to treat with the one inch of, of, of runoff from that. We, we thought it was, was really the best of all worlds. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, just moving over to beta's review, uh, Mr. Cusick. Um, for the stormwater, uh, did you get a chance to take a look at their response? Yeah, as far as as far as I know, we've addressed all of um, all of Beta stormwater comments. Okay, it looked like uh, so. Maybe I'm not looking at the most recent version, but SW two. Um, one of the comments was there was a 52% increase in volume of runoff from the site for this project for the two-year storm event. Applicants should evaluate potential impacts to wetlands and increase in down gradient flooding. So that was addressed. Yeah, we, we with the planning board hearing, we went into pretty good detail on that with beta. Okay, so was there a follow-up letter that you guys put together? Um, that was one of the items and then um, uh, there was one other one I thought. Um, hold on a second. Um, so the SWIP that was included as a condition. Um, so the erosion control barrier detail indicates use of both compost and silt fence for the perimeter provide details of these controls. So that what that was provided. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think those are the only two. Um, the snow storage, what was the decision on that said? So I guess Beta's comment was Snow storage looks minimal, but include provisions for handling of snow that exceeds the capacity. Was that? Yeah, and I think the, the provision there was, I mean, we feel as though we have enough um, room throughout the site to, to store it. However, if it becomes an issue where there, there's too much snow and there's not enough room to do it, we wouldn't have an issue with taking it off site, but we don't anticipate that, that being. Okay. Okay, so those were the three. It sounds like they were closed off. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, um, so let me open up to questions or comments from the other commission members at this point. Can we just get a quick description on that, um, the discussions with the planning board or what, what on the volume? Yeah, so essentially uh, one of Beta's comments was essentially that there was just, a, the, we were increasing the volume, the amount of volume that was um, being generated. You know, obviously when you, when you develop a site that's undeveloped, uh, you create more water. Um, you know, our initial response was that, and, and Beta concurred, that we meet the stormwater standards in that we mitigate the peak flows throughout the storms, all storm events, and recharge um, more than the required amount of water back into the ground. To which I think Beta's point was, uh, you know, they acknowledged that, but they just said, hey, since you are increasing volume, you know, is there any downstream flooding that this might occur? And the discussions around that, we, we went out and, and looked at it e even closer. Everything on the site drains to a pretty significant wetland uh, area. Uh, everything essentially flows down to the, um, to the west, uh, or excuse me, the east of, of the site. 
The wetland area is predominantly contained within our property. So even if um, th that added volume was added to the, to the wetland area, the, the amount of, um, of impact to that wetland area is really minuscule. It doesn't impact it. It's such a, a large wetland. We further reviewed where, you know, if all of a sudden that water, you know, went there, wh where does it then go? Uh, and there's actually a, I think it was a, it was either 30 or 36 inch pipe. I forget the exact size, but there's a significant pipe on the south um, east corner of the property where this entire wetland system drains into. So we viewed, went out and take a look at that pipe just to make sure it was adequate. It wasn't in need of repair. There wasn't blocked or anything that would cause some additional flooding uh, and confirmed that it is working as is intended. Um, so any of the water that got into that area would flow uh, through the wetland and in the constructed infrastructure downstream as intended. There, there wouldn't be any impacts to any offsite flooding. So the, so the potential um, increase in depths of water in the wetland um, wouldn't affect? The abutters, correct. The abutters. They're self-contained within the wetland on, on, our, on our site. And I think okay. that's what the, the request was. It was just since there was more volume there, you know, did we look at if that would impact anybody else? So if anything, it'll make your wetland line get closer to your property. Yeah, if, if <laughs> exactly. If anything, it would be a self-imposed impact if the water didn't happen to flow out the pipe at the um, at the discharge point. Um, but it, it does flow. But if that pipe were ever clogged, it would be a, an impact on our property, not on anybody else's. Do the chair? Yes, Don. Just to give you um, just a, a, a bigger picture, I don't have the entire watershed, but I can bring that up in a in another. Basically, this this part of the um, um, sub watershed is an intermittent stream, it keeps going down. It feeds into um, Lake White, uh, Lake Massanoc, and you know we've had previous problems down at um, uh, at Sandy Beach where the uh, crossing is there at Lakeshore Drive in Haywood. Um, we've had um, uh, the area uh, resized that it now it covers a 25 foot storm. And then further up, we had Fourth Road, the culvert there blew out in one of those storms. So uh, just to be ad advised that this area, this, this stream channel does have um, impacts down, downstream. So if you're adding more volume, just be aware, you know, I can bring up all that information and share it with the commission. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you need to do that, Don, um, at this point. No, I, I was going to say, I can just put in the, put in the yeah, record. In the, uh, in the record. Not for, now, for, at this, at, not at this hearing, but I can. Yeah, yeah. If you can send it to a review. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, other comments, questions from commission members? Through the chair, I have a question, I think. Yes, Ted. Um, I want to look at the IBW that's being plowed under the parking lot in the retention basin. I think I heard Matt to say that its primary purpose, the IBW, was to catch water coming off the parking lot. But I thought I understood Matt to say there is another purpose, and he was wondering if that purpose would be, uh, could be replicated in the the new long thin trench, like letting it go natural. I wonder if Matt could further explain what he was thinking about there. Uh, Mr. Goddard said, if the main purpose of that IBW is to catch water, we're replicating that purpose. I think Matt thinks that there might be another purpose to the IBW that might be getting lost, but maybe I'm wrong. I wonder if you could help me, Matt. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, the existing condition that, that out that's out there now is, um, you know, fairly small depression area that was probably man-made when the site was altered, who knows how many years ago. And now it's, as nature does, it's kind of taken things over and, and reverted back to a natural condition so that you have, you know, you might argue an, an artificial source of water that's, that's coming off the paved parking lot uh, from the adjacent property. That water is, is, you know, coming into this depression 
that depression is filling with leaves. Yes, it's got, it's most of the vegetation in there, most of the shrubby vegetation that's in there um, is an invasive species. Um, but there's still wildlife, and I'm sure Dan can speak to this, as I think he did in his report. There are still, you know, wildlife species that are utilizing that area to some extent. Um, you know, there are insects in the leaf litter. There are critters that are going to go searching for those insects. The invasive species produce fruits. There are various wildlife that's going to use that. There's, you know, the overstory of the trees. It's going to be utilized for nesting and various things. So, um, you know, I guess my point was on if we're replacing it with sort of this sort of structured best management practice drainage feature that um, presumably is going to be maintained as part, you know, under the operations and maintenance plan. And again, I, I don't have an answer to that because I didn't I didn't see an updated O and M plan. Um, but if it's sort of going to become this somewhat sterile feature, my question was, does it need to be, or could it could it not sort of be treated as a BMP, just as an area that's receiving the water, and either be you know potentially plant or or you know convert it into something more like a rain garden that's planted and, and managed that does have some value, or just be left to go natural and ideally not fill in with invasive species, but you know, fill in with, with some shrubs and have some tree overstory and leaf litter and, and all that stuff that, that's essentially out there now so that it is um, really kind of serving all, all the functions. Regard, you know, we could probably argue sort of what level of functions and values are there, but I think we all agree there are some there. Um, and the closer you can create something uh, as to what's being lost, the better chance you have of actually mitigating for it. And I think that was my point there. Thank you. So I think we heard their answer to why they don't want to try to make it bigger. Could we get a response to that part of your question? I think Matt makes some good points and I don't see any reason why we couldn't plant this area up and design it with some more naturalized components to it. Um, if that would accomplish what, what Matt's seeking, I think that could be done, you know, design it in a way that it would be something that's less maintained long term and more intended to become naturalized, but yet there's some design on its original layout. Yeah, I, I you know, into that point, uh, Mr. God, I don't think that would be too much of a heavy lift for you guys. Right. Um, you know, that, you know, make it more of a, you know, rain garden with some natural features, you mm. know, as compared to just the a uh, you know a maintained feature going forward, right? Um, Perfect. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely we'll do that. That's not a problem. And I'd also welcome some feedback too on the earlier kind of comment question I had. If the commission would rather see that the BBW replication area made smaller um, at either a one to one of BBW or one and a half to one of BBW, or whether or not it was necessary to square foot to square foot replicate the, the still uh, difference in the IVW lost area. Cause I couldn't, I, we could probably cut that uh, wetland replication area in, in half of what you currently see this, this area down below here. Yeah, I think if I, my sense is if you guys naturalize that uh, feature there um, that's taking the runoff from the other parking lot, I, don't have a problem with reducing um, the replication area to a one-to-one -to, -one to preserve some of the buffer zone. Um, but let me, you know, I, 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 you know, it's as you as you mentioned, it's regulated under the bylaw. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I'd rather preserve. You know, the replication areas are, are a little dicey sometimes, and you know how effective they are. Um, in the long run. So I, you know, I think I'd be more inclined to see some of the buffer zone preserved, but let me open it up to uh, some of the other commission members to comment on that. That's, that's my sense. Yes, I, I'd agree that I'd rather not take down for, uh, you know, forest to replicate, just to replicate. And I think, um, I think John had mentioned before 
for that area, not wanting to extend it into the buffer zone, keeping it the size it was to try and stay out of the buffer. But um, based on the plan, if that area is going to be disturbed grass area anyway in the buffer, then I would extend it as far as we're going to impact it anyway and call it replication, I think. Yeah. Rather well, than have grass possible. in the buffer. That's certainly possible. The other thing that comes to mind too is if we if we make this thing half as big and we're only, you know, as as big as the impact area right here, then we we might not even need to come in this location altogether. You know, we might be able to just kind of tuck it in right in the immediate proximity of the of the crossing. Whereas when we, had to, when we had to make it so large, there just wasn't many other places to make you couldn't we couldn't make it that large over in here. I was thinking the same thing, Scott, that if, if you're already in the disturbing for putting in your retaining walls and everything, you might be able to put it right in tight to right next to the impact area. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes, that makes sense to me too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So the next meetings are, oh, let me open up to public uh, comment or questions at this point. Is there anyone in the audience that has a comment or a question? I don't see any hands raised. Okay. All right. So our next meeting, uh, Mr. God, the 9th or the 23rd. Is there a preference? And hopefully we'll be able to get this. Yeah, so out. We're gonna, clearly we're going to make a, another plan revision here. It doesn't seem like it's going to be that much work. Um, I probably go to the next meeting. You know, and if something happens that somehow that isn't satisfied, we can go out to the 23rd. But I think, I think we could target pretty safely probably the meeting on the 9th, two weeks from today. And we'll okay. work to get you everything from our end a week from today. And that would be one week prior to the next meeting. And if Matt has additional comments on his, I don't know if he'll be producing another comment letter or just maybe have a couple of comments. Other than what yeah, we I, tonight, you know, he, if he gets those to us prior to even the end of the week, then what, we should still be okay to get you something by the second. Yeah, Jeff, I, I guess the, that's the question. I mean, I, typically, how we, as you know, how we do our response letters, we kind of take the letter and kind of go back and forth point by point. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to put more of just sort of a bulleted list, maybe in an email to Don um, that he can distribute out that you know, kind of gets down to brass tacks as far as what I guess my bigger points are rather than kind of going make, the formal route. If, that sounds if good. Prefer. That sounds good, Matt. Let's just do that. Right. I think that's fine. Okay. Then I guess we'd request a continuation to the ninth. Okay. All right. We'll do that. And if you can just send us an email to that effect. I'll send it right now. Great. Okay. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Okay. So Don, moving along with the work session items. We have uh, Brock 19 Wood Street, the cease yep. and desist order. Just trying to close out the last meeting. Yep, I'll give you a minute. I'll be back in a second, okay. While you're doing that.
Okay. So we had some land clearing here, Don, in the buffer zone. Yeah, um, we got a, a complaint uh, when I guess someone was driving by. So uh, Matt was able to go out and take a look at the uh, at the site and uh, was able to get some photos from the uh, from the road. And it looks like basically some of the site activity might have um, been within might have been within 100 feet of uh, um, wetlands that are uh, off property. So okay. um, basically, we had uh, a chance just to write a, a cease and desist letter to uh, the property owner, and the uh, the developer just did call me before the meeting. Um, so I don't know if he's in the audience, um, but he was he was hoping to get a. Um, I was able to just play voice mail tag um, with him, um, Mr. Carter. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we um, think we'd, we'd probably need some more information to figure out if some of this area is, um, we believe it's within the commission's jurisdiction, but then we would know, typically you guys would look at, um, would, would you have approved something like this? And would you be looking for an after the fact filing or would you have not approved it? And you know, you, you would then maybe go the um, enforcement or restoration order route, but uh, not knowing you know, the distances, you know, did they go inside the 50, yada, right, yada. Yeah, yeah. We're not quite sure um, where to go from there. So we didn't know if the commission was, would be looking for more information. A lot of the information we have at town hall is very sketchy, like his information we have from the building department, but it's not showing any wetlands off off site, you know, so yeah, and it looks like there was some lawn area in the past, but some of the clearing would have been in this area and, and, and down in here. So it looks like there might have been some new clearing and maybe some of the other area might have been recently disturbed, you know, right, right. Okay. Yeah, so I think the the, the uh, and we have Mr. and Mrs. Brock um, in the audience, so I'll you know they can speak in a in a minute here. Um, but yeah, I think the distance is a key, Don. Um, you know, certainly if it's within the fifty foot buffer zone, you know, if it was not disturbed previously, you know, we probably would have wanted that to remain undisturbed. Um, but you know, we would have entertained. 50 to 100 foot, you know, with um, some limiting disturbance, but uh, I think we need to know the distances. But uh, Mr. or Mrs. Brock, are you present? Yes, we are. Hi, good evening. Hi, thanks for having us. Sure. Um, so the, um, the land was cleared um, recently because we've had some invasive vines um, that were taking over our side yard or our front yard. Um, and we were losing two to three large trees a year that were falling into our yard where our two young kids play. Um, so we had the invasive vines and dead trees removed, um, but nothing else. There's been no site regrading. Um, and we have full plans to replant the area and regrass the area as soon as spring comes. Um, so there's, there's no intention to keep it as it is now. Um, and we, had Mike Mansard out with our landscaper and they walked the entire site before we began. Mm -hmm. And um, Mike confirmed that none of the trees that we were taking or brush that was coming off was on the um, town's right of way. And he also said there was no issues with wetlands or any other restrictions um, that he knew of. So we proceeded. That's why we're, we were just surprised to get your letter. Um, and we wanted to let you know that we have full plans to have everything planted um, and regrassed as soon as spring comes. We just needed to get rid of the invasive vines. Okay. We, we stopped um, <clears throat> We stopped at the bottom of the, uh, the grassed area that we had mm -hmm. and, and then went straight to the road from there. And we did it mostly to preserve some of the large trees that otherwise would have died. We, we actually lost probably a hundred foot tree and we, we were fearing that we'd lose another one. <clears throat> and actually, we'd had some tree limbs that had fallen into the street that the town tree committee had put just into the property. Um, right. So, so we were, you know, we basically just wanted to get the, the dead trees picked up because all of those trees that you see um, down at the bottom 
you know, on the far left at the, at the uh, top, kind of. Mm -hmm. There's five of them that were falling with no up further. Up further. further. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Five of them that way were, okay. were, were, um, were uh, dead with vine growth that pulled on them. So we have no idea if there's wetlands next door. We don't even know the name of the property owner of the next door region. We don't hike around their property. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and we didn't know if there was a border region, but you know, we, we checked with the, uh, with the with the town we felt no, no uh, so that was you know they obviously didn't point out to you guys that um you know that the was buffer zone area potentially in in the, you know the area where you were doing the work so we under, we understand it happens to folks um so i think what we just need to do is clarify where the buffer zone is to the wetland because you know, we don't want that being converted to grass area, you know, unless it was previously grass area. You know, if it was previously grass, that's fine, but we don't want new buffer zone. We don't want buffer zone being converted to, you know, lawn area um, that wasn't already previously lawn, if that makes any sense. That makes sense. And, um, you know, if there was a significant amount of, you know, brush and, and that type of thing, you know, I don't know the extent of it at this point. We just don't know because we don't know where the boundary is. You know, if you're doing plantings, you know, if you're replanting that area, we would just take a look at, you know, the area that's in buffer zone and the certain species of plants uh, that grow in buffer zone. So we would just ask that, you know, rather than putting ornamental type stuff in, you put, you know, uh, plants in that you know function for the that have you know better functionality for the for the buffer zone you know like blueberry bushes you know that those, those types of things uh, rhododendron um, so Don what's uh, can we get kind of an estimate of where the buffer zone is by taping it off I mean I don't know if we need to have these guys do a wetland you know survey you know what's your what's your in that sense there well if they wanted to allow us to come on you know obviously we're not surveys but if they wanted us to come onto their property we'd try to get a better sense of you know and obviously the wetlands look like they're on the neighbor's property you know so we'd want to get permission from the neighbor too you know wow. before we go on uh the property mm. Is that, is that more, than, more than welcome to come on our property. Um, I don't believe I don't anyone even, know who's that neighbor is. Yeah. Um, on the other side is um, Jim. I don't know, Jim, if you know who owns that property. Um, sort of. Um, but can we just stipulate? Can they just stip I was going to recuse myself. Um, hi, guys. Um, but... <laughs> Can't you just stipulate that it is uh, within something? I mean, it's you know, it appears to be a well, right? Well, we we, so we don't we, doing we, even we, any instead of even doing any boundary surveys or anything, <coughs> any wetland surveys. Why don't why don't you just stipulate that it's that it's subject to our jurisdiction? No, we we <laughs> believe it is. We believe we believe site clearing occurred within the commission's jurisdiction within 100 feet of the resource areas. We don't know how close. You know, did they go within 25, so 30, you know, 50? Does that matter? Does that matter? Well, well yeah. yeah. Thinking, restoration. Why, why measure out for the wetland or anything if it's obviously there? Well, in, in the past, to be the, the commission tries to get a sense of okay, an, an activity occurred. Is this something that um, if before they did it, if they if they applied for a permit, is it something the commission would have, you know, entertained as an RDA or an NOI, hence outside the 50? Um, and then the commission usually would say, all right, why don't we just pursue this as an after the fact permit application, either an RDA or an NOI based on the scope of of the work? Or if it's like, no, you know, it was, you know, inside 50 and it's something that they wouldn't have wanted to see go from brush to, to lawn, um, 
then they would look for restoration. So, well, I haven't seen it, but it it didn't go to lawn, right, Lauren? Or did it go to lawn? No. Brian, do you mean it's? I haven't looked at it, but did the lawn expand, or did you just take down the no. chair and stuff along the road? We just took down um, the vines and the dead trees. There was maybe five dead trees that had fallen over the years that we had cleared out, but no, it's it's just clear now. And we are you put, expanding? Are we expanding? Um, the not that far down. I mean, we'll put. We are mm -hmm. planning to put trees down at that end. Yeah. We had planned arborvitaes, but we're certainly open to a more buffer friendly um bush if, if someone can recommend that but or tell us where it where it yeah. where the jurisdiction starts because it, it's it's from that tree that you see in that picture mm -hmm. to the corner of our property is 50 feet to the chair and yes so yeah. then if it's in our neighbors i don't know what the neighbors have or call at i mean yeah go, where go is ahead now so, so I, I went out there and, and took a look, and maybe I can ask uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brock. Um, as you walk down the slope there, there's a rather unique feature that I saw where somebody had disposed of, looked like a whole bunch of Christmas wreaths by putting them on the branch of one of the trees down there. Oh, I don't yeah. know if that's you guys or a neighbor or, yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, that's our property. That's our so. property, yep. Okay. So there's been, historically there's been some dumping going on there. It looks like you know, just there. yard yeah. waste, things like that. Yeah. Uh, wreaths. Um, so as you walk past that area, the land drops off pretty sharply down to an area where if you went, you'd want to be wearing boots. Um, yeah, and that picture there. So I'm standing. That area of of the dumping is sort of right directly behind me. This is dropping off, you know, maybe three or four feet down, and you can see um, it's pretty wet down the bottom there. So essentially, the wetland boundary is right there. So I think some of this work clearly occurred within 50 feet. Um, and if it's going to be, you know, revegetated, however, I, I, I think that's fine. I, I did see plenty of evidence that the area was full of uh, bittersweet vines, and I'm sure it was killing all the trees in there. Um, the other thing that I would say is that bittersweet's going to continue to grow back. This isn't a, you're not going to be able to just plant something and be like, okay, we're all done. It's going to be a, uh, unfortunately, as long as you own that property, a, a battle to keep those vines down because the seed stock is all in the soil now. Um, so as Don said, I mean, we could go out there and, and potentially just throw up a couple of flags just to kind of say, okay, this is, you know, if you measure 100 feet off of these or 50 feet off of these, this is where the extent of any lawn should be, that would be, you know, a pretty quick and easy thing to do, I think. With, you know, sure. We don't have to flag the whole boundary. Is it 50 or 100? Um, but it looked like, I mean, there was quite a bit of soil pushed around out there too. And again, I don't know what it looked like before. Um, you know, it looked yeah, like- none it was, of the soil was moved. It, yeah, it, there it, wasn't it, any regrading. It yeah, just was them probably driving over that it was to get the trees. Leveling, that, that was just them moving the, uh, the cat back and forth to, to grind the tree. Yeah, it looked like, I mean, oftentimes landscapers, when they leave, they want it to look nice and neat. So they probably kind of leveled things off, maybe even more than you intended. Um, but be that yeah. as it may, certainly that area would be ready for planting or hydro seeding or what have you. Yeah, that part was grass, sort of where you're showing right now. That actually was grass. Up to the pine tree. Up to the pine tree, yeah. All right, so what, Matt, if, uh, why don't you take a take a look out there, you know, like you said, put a couple flags in, kind of, you know, establish the boundary as best we can, you know, um, and then, you know, you can make some recommendations as to, you know, plantings to restore the area you know, beyond the lawn area. Um, can, can I not, not beyond the lawn area, within the lawn area. That's the, that is our lawn right so there. So right to that pine tree in that image, that was all grass to begin with. Um, okay. Just to clarify. Okay, all right. So what, does that make sense, Matt, Don, commission members? To the chair, may I just ask a quick question? Sure. Um, the the trees that were removed were all trees that had already fallen is that true there were no standing dead trees that were removed 
There was there was one standing one standing one. dead tree and five that had fallen. Half of it had fallen though. Yeah. Half of the standing dead one had fallen. The reason I bring it up is we very often approve removal of dead trees, but if they're within the buffer, we usually want that tree, uh, another tree replanted in that spot. So if that is a tree that again, is it within that 50 foot, I, I would be interested in that being part of the replant. We, we have plans to replant the trees actually, or not replant, to plant trees. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, wonderful. We, we're planting four trees. Jeff, Thank you. Jeff, can I ask a question, Jeff? Yep. So do you have, do you have a landscape plan? Brian? Yes. So do we have that done? No, we do not. I, I can share it on my screen now or I, I can send it to someone. Well, well, I was just, what I was thinking before is if there, if all that's going to happen now is planting, new plantings, which they're planning on doing, let's just, you know, let them, you know, put it, submit a landscape plan and see if that's okay. Because they're because this needs to be stabilized, right? So we don't want to, right? You know, you want to stabilize this, but it this is done. If it was all long long before, then it seems to me that what needs to be done is stabilized in the new plantings. Right, and, and we want we want you know buffer zone friendly plantings. You know, not necessarily arborvitae. Yeah. So, Mrs. Brock, if you can send us the landscaping plan, okay. You know, Matt can go out take a look at the boundary there. And then, you know, I, my sense is, is that, um, you know, um, you know, we can just swap out, you know, a few of your proposed plants in that buffer zone area to plants that are more friendly to, you know, the, the wildlife and the, you know, the habitat in the buffer zone. Okay, um, that sounds fair enough. Yeah, um, so I, can I bring up one more question? Sure. Um, so be, due to the cease and desist order, um, we're not supposed to do anything on the site, which we understand, but there is a large um, maple tree on the other side of our driveway, 270 feet from the area you're concerned with, that we had plans to have taken down on Saturday um, because it's dead and falling into the street. It's, um, I can show you right here. We just wanted um, to see if we could have permission. We already have the police detail scheduled for Saturday to have that taken down? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It doesn't seem like it's in our jurisdiction. Yeah. No, I didn't think so, but we wanted to make sure since we got your letter. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And then, you know, let's just have Matt go out, you know, as we as we had talked about, you know, we can establish a couple flags, kind of get a general area of to the get a general idea of the area, you know, that the buffer zone portion was disturbed. And I think it would just be a matter of um, taking a look at your landscaping plan and maybe swapping out a couple of the species from off buffer zone okay. friendly species, as, as we had said. So, okay. That sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Thanks Thank for. You. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Okay. Plaskin, Don, fifty three Hayward. Yes. Um, didn't get the chance to um, reach out to the property owner yet. We did receive a complaint. Matt was able to go out and take a look at the site. Um, just trying to get the folder open here. Work session. I was hoping to reach out to the uh, property owner before the meeting, but I uh, was not able to. I was gonna try and send a similar cease and desist. So uh, Matt's photos and just trying to give you- Doing some clearing in the buffer zone. Yeah, and uh, from what we understand, it might've been storm damaged um, trees. Um, okay. Don, do you want me to just kind of give a summary from <clears throat> my visit? Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. And I'll just bring up the rest of the plans I have so they can yeah. get an idea. So, um, Don uh, gave me the task of going out and checking out the property and advised me that the easiest access was actually from 80 South Street, um, mm -hmm. which is where the that built the big building there that was the temporary town hall. Yeah, um, there's public this public land right through here. Mm -hmm. This is Old Town Road, and the town also owns this parcel here. 
So Matt was going to try and look on Haywood Street and from Old Town Road to see what he could see. Yep. So I went out, um, took a look, and, and clearly there had been some fairly recent um, cutting of some vegetation or at least cutting of wood um, and a little bit of spreading of soil from what I could tell. And while I was out there, the owner came out and you know, rightfully asked what I was doing in her backyard. So I explained I was there with the commission, um, you know, investigating a, a possible violation. And she explained that they had had some storm damage, some trees come down. Um, they had somebody come in to, to, to cut up the trees and take them away. And um, that they had, it wasn't exactly sure it was a little vague as far as the pushing around of some soil. I don't know if soil was brought in or if soil had just been turned up potentially by a, a tree coming down. Uh, and if potentially that was just kind of some regrading going on. Um, didn't see anything too egregious from the inspection that I had, um, to be honest with you. Um, and then I just reported that back to Don. I think Don the plan was to contact the homeowner and maybe get a little bit more detail on exactly um, what had occurred out, out there to report back to you. That was it. Okay. I think that makes sense, Don. You know, you yeah. just have, have them uh, put them on the agenda for the next meeting. Okay. And they can just uh, kind of walk through what happened, but it doesn't sound like it's a big deal from what Matt is saying. So, you know, We'll just no, I mean, because it's not like they were clear cutting, you know, you still have a lot of trees throughout here, so yeah. it seems plausible. And then I think the commission would just want this area to be stabilized, you know, so you don't have a lot of runoff, you know, it's not yeah. the time of year to do it now, but, you know, just making them aware that, you know, there is some jurisdiction on their property. Yeah, yeah. Let it revegetate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so Upper Charles Trail Committee, and I'll hand this off to Mr. Cirillo. Yes, thank you. Um, Anna, Don, did you get the, the real map? Yeah. Did you get my last email? Is it I possible did. to put it up? If, if not, we'll just... it right now as we speak. So I, what I wanted to do here is just update. Um, you know, the Upper Charles Trail Committee will submit an NOI probably sometime in june for this so-called campus trail connector and i just wanted to uh bring everybody sort of up to speed we've done a couple of site walks we have a site walk we have a site walk with halt tomorrow and then we're talking to the school department because this is all on school department land if you have the not that one because that one's not right um oh okay this is what you sent I me sent it I sent it during the meeting. Did Annie get it? Oh, you mean right I'll now? You Tonight? Yeah. Hold on. Yeah, yes, I did. All right. So if you didn't, then forget it. We'll table it till next time. It's not critical. Let's just put this aside till next time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see your email. So you, we'll just table it? Yeah, table it. Next time we'll, we'll bring up the proper map. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay. So can I move on to something else, which is uh, Parks and Rec in Sandy Beach? That's on the public forum requests. Do you want to oh. wait until we get to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's just, um, we have one more item on the regular agenda, Jim, and then we'll move on to the public okay, forum. Okay, that's cool. Um, that was the, dr the draft annual report. So Don, I took a look at that. I thought it looked great. Um, I didn't have any comments. Do you want to distribute that to the other commission members for comment? I did. I, I believe I emailed it out to everyone. Oh, you did. Okay. All right. Perfect. Did everyone get a chance to look at that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I well, done. To... well done. Well done. It up on the screen. Sorry. I, I thought I was share screening, but I'm sorry I wasn't. Screen sharing. So if there's no further edits, I can move that along to the town manager's office. I'm good, Don. I, I'll I'll let everyone else uh, weigh in. Look look good to me. Looks good to 
Jim. Yeah, I'm good with it. I'm good. Thank you. Well done. Oh. Yep. Okay, Don. I think you're good. Thank you. All right. All right. Public forum requests. Do you want to do uh, jump to number two? That uh, to let Jim go, and then we go to one. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. So I don't have that that list. So number two is Sandy Beach. Yeah, it's on your screen now. Yep, the Parks and Rec Sandy Beach. Yeah, okay, let's see. All right, Parks and Rec Sandy Beach. Um, okay, so uh, as some of you may know, um, question came up with CPC a week or our last meeting about the status of projects. We always do that. One of the projects is Park and Rex. Um, what's going on with Sandy Beach? And what's going on with the proposed dock? seasonal dock. So I've sort of taken, I don't know, charge of trying to get this thing wrapped up. And it's become obvious to me from conversations with Jay Gelpi and with the information you gave me, Don, that there's, um, it's, it's a mess. Um, so I got everything you gave me, which is, I knew that there was no CFC. I suspect there's no as built, which I know we need. We con con. Um, and then you, you shared with me these other things that I hadn't gotten around to figuring out yet. Like, uh, there's no replication reports. Uh, you know, some things didn't appear to have been done the way they were planned to be done. Parking lot, um, stormwater BMPs. So, uh, and then you had the question of the annual stormwater management reports. I am going to um, go down there, look at everything, report back to Dave Del Torrio and Jay Gelfi, and see if we can wrap this stuff up. If there's any outstanding questions in terms of work that wasn't done, um, I'll let them know and try to figure out what to do about it and be in touch with you, Don. I do have one basic question. The original order of conditions was issued in 2010. Did, we, did they get an extension in 2013? Well, oh, Jim, that sounds a little off. Um, yeah, it was late. Wasn't it yeah, the, uh, here the order was issued in December 2012, hence it would have been three years, okay. so 2015. And no, there's no nothing in the file that they requested an extension permit. Yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me. Um, okay, so at this point, then, the you know, it's expired. Um, right. In order to you know, to request a COC. Yeah. They what would, do we do? They would show the phases of what they built, which was all the Sandy Beach area, and they didn't, you know, do the, what? redo the parking lot. They didn't put in the new, you know, stormwater right. management, BMPs, rain garden, yada, yada, you know, but uh, they still should have done What I don't know is, area. what I don't know is that they finished construction by 2015. And I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, sent, I sent an email in 2016 saying it looks like your project's done. You know, you should be submitting a, 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 a COC application. It fell on deaf ears. Uh, yeah, yeah, if, I, if oh, my okay, memory so if my memory serves, Jim, they did get it done. The, they, they got the portion of the project done that they had the funding for, which yeah. was basically the Sandy Beach, you know, the, like the restoration of the area where you know the beach area the playground area right. they put the they put the they did work on the on the bridge you know crossing but none of the parking lot work was ever done and i don't think was the replication area ever done done i don't think so that's what i was asking they never gave us reports right where well, so yeah so all that work great I know that I know that the parking lot that's been the discussion many occasions from everything from you know hanging out at town meeting to a bunch of things where the whatever happened to the money and I'm aware they had some issues during construction so I'm going to work out I'm going to try to uh, work out with Dave Del Torrio, Weston and Sampson and Parks and Rec to get all the reporting done um, and status what wasn't done and why it wasn't done. So in the near future, 
will be coming in with the Parks and Rec will be coming in with something. Right now, I'm just sorting it all out, and it's kind of a cluster. So, okay. Uh, sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, there's the wetland wetland replication area. I don't think they ever did that, Don. Okay. No, where is that? It's right near the bridge oh. there. See that hashed mark to the uh, north west yeah. of the bridge? Yeah. Right there. Yep. So we're gonna widen the road. Okay. Here. And then there was and then there was another one right there. Yeah. That's where the dumpster is right now. In that area. Uh, so we disturbed. Okay. Well, I'm going to go out there. Um, I'll report back and uh, keep you updated on the status, but I'm trying to help them get done with this so they can move on to this seasonal dock question before okay. spring. So hopefully we can make things move fast. So I just wanted to let you know that. Okay. All right. Thanks do for I the get, update, Jim. Yeah. Do I get a bonus on the public form or it had to be listed? You get a bonus. I get a bonus? Okay, cool. It'll be in the mail the next couple of days. <laughs> don't, don't spend it before you get it, though. All right, two quick things. One, um, I uh, had an email conversation with Jamie Ronka, thinking of public forum request. I asked Jamie how she was doing, how TCMC was doing their meeting on Thursday night, finally, since the last time was last March, apparently. And they're going to be discussing the so-called back of the Hughes Trail. I heard at along someplace, Upper Charles or CPC, Peter Lagoy talking about a new, another crossing, another wetlands crossing on the Hughes Trail. Um, so I've asked Jamie to come into one of our meetings and fill us in on what TCMC is up to on Hughes. So she'll probably do that in a couple weeks. Okay. All right. So that was the bonus you're talking about. Yeah, but second bonus is I want to hear, I'd like to hear from Ted about the proposed tree cutting uh, limitations thing if he wants to talk about it. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do the uh, project change request first and then we'll hand it off okay. to Ted. All right. All right, so this was the Wilson Street Solar. Don, they want to move the roadway apparently or shift the roadway. All right. Yeah, this came in um, yeah, late on. Yeah. So I, I I was out on Friday, Monday. I didn't have a chance to to review any of, of this. Um, Should we table it till the next meeting? What do you guys want? They, they basically they're saying it's um, they think it's um, all insignificant, you know, so I just haven't been able to had a chance to say, yeah, that that looks about right. Of, of course, they're going to say it's all insignificant, right? Right, right exactly. Yeah, and let's let's table it so you have adequate time to review it, Don. All right, cool. We will uh, do that rather than kind of fumbling through it now. Yeah. Okay. All right, Ted, good. you get the mic. All right. I will again. Um, it's a long two and a half year story that I'll try to make clear and short. Um, Two and a half years ago in Zach, we began exploring ways to try to control commercial solar development in town. Uh, looking at Don's summary of CONCOM this past year, I noticed that we have approved four different commercial solar developments in, in 2020. Um, you'll probably remember that a year ago, heading into town meeting, there was a um, bylaw proposal to have a commercial solar overlay district. Uh, when we got to the October town meeting, um, that and all other zoning uh, proposals were um, tabled. The idea being we don't want to extend town meeting during times of COVID. So then Zach was asked to take a good hard look at that zoning overlay so that we could answer some questions that were raised about it. And here was the ultimate uh, um, where we landed. There were three kind of very restrictive proposals to try to control commercial solar development. All of them, by the way, came from me. Uh, one is the, the solar overlay, which had been sitting there for a year. Uh, there was discussion to limit commercial solar development only to commercial areas in town, it being a commercial use. Uh, and that would have been industrial A or industrial A and B. Um, and then finally, borrowing from a bylaw that was passed in Athol uh, to limit 
um, commercial solar development only to land that had been previously disturbed. Um, the overlay had been approved in Weston and Wellesley, and I think another town, the previously disturbed had been approved and signed off by the attorney general in Athol. Uh, a and B just seemed natural. Town council said that all of those would be difficult to defend if someone challenged them because the state, the Commonwealth, has made so clear that they want to encourage solar development. And all of those town council thinks would be very difficult to defend because they are too restrictive and run counter to what the Commonwealth is trying to encourage. So uh, I was frustrated, but town council was convincing. And in the end, I was, I was swayed. We started that whole process with two main goals. Number one, protect neighborhoods from being seriously negative in, negatively impacted by solar development the way the Alexander Road development was. Um, number two, protect trees. What Zach put forward to the planning board was ultimately a much more strict bylaw proposal that would um, raise the standards of screening both visually and acoustically far beyond where they are now. And included in that proposal was much more documentation that need to be presented by the developer ahead of time, um, much more extensive documentation and studies. Uh, if that moves forward, that accomplishes one of our two part goals that would accomplish if the, the planning board enforces said rules in the future, the protecting neighborhoods. It does not necessarily protect trees. Mm -hmm. Town council suggested to us, and this is now just like two weeks ago, you could also put forward a tree protection bylaw that could be a zoning bylaw, that could be a general bylaw. Towns have done both. Uh, town council drew up for us a couple proposals. One that would be a, uh, you may do some cutting without permit as long as you follow these rules. And I'll try to touch on those in a moment. The other is you may do some cutting on major projects with a permit. Essentially the way those proposed bylaws would work is if your project is greater than, and they have a couple different thresholds depending on which zoning area, 20,000 square feet, 40,000 square feet, 60,000 square feet, then you could clear 20% of the trees, 40%, 60, and those numbers don't necessarily align. I'm just trying to paint roughly the way that would work. So those were the two proposals that were brought. Um, Zach asked, the select board through Amy Rutterbush to consider making it a general bylaw proposal and put it on the warrant. The thinking being then you need only 50% plus one vote at town meeting to pass a general bylaw. To pass a zoning bylaw, you need a two thirds vote at town meeting. Uh, Amy Rutterbush went to the select board meeting tonight. She presented the, um, the idea uh, tried to explain that town council drew up these ideas. So we already have town council's legal thumbs up, um, but she was unable to sway select board uh, members to put a, a placeholder and then further discuss it through select board. That failed four to one. So where does it go now? This, this again would accomplish our second of two prongs, protecting trees. If we have the increased screening and we have a tree protection, we've accomplished both of our goals. Um, where it stands now is, um, based on what I heard in a planning board meeting last night, the planning board will now scramble to put together a, another meeting that is not currently on the calendar and consider moving forward as a zoning bylaw um, and putting it into town meeting. And that's where we stand now. There's also always the option of having a citizen's petition and I'm pretty sure it could be a general bylaw or a, a zoning bylaw, um, but sometimes it's hard to get traction on citizens' petitions without kind of those big boards backing them up. So yeah. that's where it stands now. Um, I will add one addendum. There were a number of members of the planning board that were very frustrated that the overlay disappeared from discussion. And so in the planning board last night, they voted to have a placeholder for the new extensive screening bylaw, and they put a placeholder to continue to discuss the solar overlay. Um, 
but they may not move. They may not move to put either one on the warrant. They may choose to put both of those on the warrant. They may choose to put one and not the other on the warrant. But that's where all of that discussion is right now. Okay. Hopefully that was clear enough. Yep, I think that makes sense. Uh, Crystal, can I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Absolutely. I'll try to. Actually, <laughs> actually, I guess it's probably a couple of statements. Um, I think if some people know that I'm not one to shy away from disagreeing with someone, uh, but the solar overlay, I have to respectfully disagree with town council. There already are bylaws that apparently town council considers too restrictive that have been approved. So I don't know why it's not worth putting forth another one. Um, and then the other comment is um, it, it's um, the term living soil has become uh, something uh, that I've heard about recently. Living soil being the natural forest, the natural uh, forest floor and the other living things, vegetation, that are so useful in uh, carbon sequestration that they shouldn't be removed. Um, so anyway, um, I know that living soil is not part of this, but certainly uh, I'm all for limiting tree removal because the trees do sequester carbon. And that's, I think, the goal of everybody. So anyway, I, it, Ted, I would support any, uh, any citizen petition that would need to be done too. So anyway, thanks for your update, it was awesome. Super quick, Jim, there are members of the planning board that agree with your first point, And that's one of the reasons the overlay is still up for discussion. Good. I mean, was there, did, did town council give reasoning on why they didn't, did they thought this would get challenged if other towns have done it successfully? Sure, um, they actually did. Um, and that's the key. Town council says the attorney general will sign off on just about anything. The real question is if someone challenges it in court, who's gonna win that decision? When it comes to the overlay, uh, yeah, and if Weston has a very restrictive overlay, Wellesley has a absurdly restrictive overlay. The thinking is it hasn't been challenged because the land simply costs too much in Weston and Wellesley for any solar developer to want to buy land to challenge it. So they can have their restrictive overlay without fear of it being challenged in court. Um, Athol is a different question. Um, town council wouldn't say this will fail in court in Athol. He said, I would not want to be the one defending it if someone in Athol does choose to challenge it. <laughs> the Athol bylaw was passed a year and a half ago, not even a year and a half ago, and it may not have been around enough yet to be challenged at this point. Um, and again, the reason is because the state has actively uh, encouraged solar. They, they've written it into state law. We want more solar. And that's what makes solar different from a dump or, or, or a car wash or all sorts of other businesses. The state's mm -hmm. not actively trying to have more car washes. And so I think my point, my point bringing up the living zoning section. So I was bringing up the living soil thing because I think the state's going to have a different perspective um, on bylaws, on solar bylaws, and solar development. And that perspective, well, I think their perspective is going to change. And I don't know that they've been as restrictive as we've heard from people. But the state, the state, I mean, I've read the state regulations. I don't see that it says thou shalt be able to do a solar array anywhere they want. I mean, we know we have issues with educational institutions and, and their ability to, to skirt uh, zoning bylaws, but I don't see anything that says build a solar array anywhere you want to without regard to the natural environment or anything else. So I think that might change, but I'm glad that you're pursuing it. I'm glad that planning board is still pursuing it. Yeah, thank, thanks for the update, Ted. So Anna, Anna just brought to my attention that we have uh, one or two folks on the line from Grasshopper um, that we tabled till next week. I didn't know if, uh, I don't know if it's Mr. King or Mr. Fasendola, if you wanted to just quickly uh, make a statement on the uh, request. 
I was just listening in. This is uh, Nick Fasendola. I just, I just haven't turned you guys off yet. So uh, I have no statement to make. Uh, Chris King may want to provide a statement uh, for the applicant, but um, at this moment, I have no statement or presentation for the commission. Okay. We, you know, apologies. We just didn't get a chance to take a, you know, a close look at the request. Um, so we just thought it made sense to have uh, Don go through that in a little bit more detail so we can uh, discuss it, you know, from an educated standpoint at the, at the next meeting. Well, hopefully that works for you guys, which is February 6th. Understood. Um, we nine. appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then just last for the um, uh, public forum, just to keep everyone updated on the uh, conservation administrator um, process. We have, I guess it closes out in two days. Um, and we have 14 applications in so far. Um, I haven't seen any of the or, or 14 resumes. I haven't seen any of them yet, but um, you know, I'll reach out to Elaine um, when the uh, posting officially closes on Thursday. Um, and and uh, let you let you guys know how it looks. All right. How does that process go, Jeff? Who actually does the the interviewing, hiring? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So when I talked to Norman about it originally, he was saying that was going to be outsourced. But I guess um, the town of Hopkinton is running the process now. It wasn't outsourced. I'm not sure who's doing it. I guess it's the HR uh, group in town. Um, Elaine, so Elaine put the the posting together, you know, the advertisement, sent that out to Mac and a couple other um, channels. And um, the resumes are being submitted to the HR folks. And then they'll put an internal group together to review the resumes. Um, I think Anna is going to be in that group and then a couple other, someone from HR, Elaine obviously will be involved. Uh, I'm not sure the extent to which I'll be involved. I mean, I, I think they'll let me review the resumes at least and make recommendations. Um, and when I get the resumes, I'll, you know, send them to you guys to get your feedback as well. Uh, but as far as being involved in the interview process, I think that's all held by or I've run by folks who are actually employed by the town. They'll narrow the list down and then um, to two or three people. And then, you know, obviously we'll, I think we'll be able to give our feedback. So that says I understand it most of, but you know, I'm not hundred percent sure. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find out from Elaine on Thursday and I'll uh, send an email out to everyone to let you know exactly how it's, what the process is. Through the, through the chair. Yep. Yeah. And in the past, like when we've had like the principal planner position, you know, basically, yeah, HR would get, yeah, like 14 resumes and they might whittle it down to like, let's, let's call in six, you know, or, or you know, six for interviews. Then they put a team together, you know, of uh, usually someone from LUP or, and other people, you know, outside of LUP. So they'll they usually have like five or six, you know, on an interview team. And then they do the, you know, first round of interviews and then they whittle it down to two or three and invite a second round and then recommendations are sent from the you know everyone who was on the team gives HR their input you know on on what they got out of it and then HR brings it to the Tom manager's office and the Tom manager you know takes all that input and makes the call right okay Anna are you uh, are you going to be involved in the review? I haven't been invited or informed of any reviews at this point yet. Okay. Yeah, they don't usually make the teams till after the closing has posted. So I know okay. it had been discussed in the past, but I haven't been part of it at all. Yeah, I would think that since you're going to be working with the person, you should be on the team that's reviewing the resumes, right, and interviewing. So Yeah, I'm happy to if that's what they choose. Okay. All right. Well, can we ask them to choose? I'll, I'll 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 talk to when I talk to Elaine on Thursday. There you um, go. Yeah, yeah. Right. We'll make the we'll make the suggestion. We will. 
Squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, nobody ever gives me any grease. <laughs> All right. Any anyone else have anything? Then or are we good? It's kind of a long meeting tonight. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. And a second, please. I'll second. Jim second in, and we'll do the roll call. Melissa. Hi. Carrie. Hi. Janine. Hi. Ted. Hi. Jim. Hi. And Jeff's and I. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank good you night. all. See you. Yeah. Well. Take care, Thank you. Everyone.